A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. Star Wars Lost Tribe of the Sith Number 9 Pandemonium by John Jackson Miller Read by Decade Bird Publishing Featuring Joe Funderburk One. Two thousand nine hundred and seventy-five years BBY. Ready. Aim. Fire. A dozen wooden launchers sounded in unison, the mighty click crack echoing throughout the fortress. After a second for the balusters to reload, a similar sound followed. And then another. The noise marked the quarter hour here in the little village the same way it did in the larger cities of the continent. It could well have been the national anthem, some had said, but Alancier already had patriotic songs in plenty. The gunners were good here, Cora thought, observing the practice range as she guided her Muntok into the compound. The arrival of the lumbering six-legged reptile and its Kashiri rider did nothing to distract the cadets from their shooting. The second between shots of their high-tension hand ballistae was a quicker rate than most gunners of the Metropolitan Uplands could manage. Was it the weapons or the warriors? Probably both, she mused. Her own district of Arar was farther back in the continent's interior. The Kashiri here at the fort at Garrow's Neck, sitting athwart one of the long spurs into the western sea, would have to be better, this was where the threat was. Cora had every right to be here but she still felt out of place. Tan and gray waistcoat, silver hair balled tightly into a bun, that was fine military style where she was from, but this was a working camp. She'd known hard work, but lately it had been of a different. Halt there! A burgundy-faced captain near the range blew a whistle and ran toward her. <whistles> Cora yanked the reins and called out. The massive Muntok skidded violently to a stop spraying purple grit into the face of the approaching officer. He swore as he tried to clean his one good eye. Sorry, Cora said, slapping the jowls of the growling beast. Muntoks are all legs and a cloud of sand. The captain didn't laugh. Documents. I was already cleared at the east gate. How do you think I got? Documents. He lifted his sidearm. It was, she assumed, loaded with fragmenting sliver bolts, not the cheap glass rods fired by the trainees. Right. They're all business out west, Cora thought, reaching into her pouch. She passed a leather folder to the captain. Letters of transit and my commission. The trainees had stopped shooting now, their young eyes on her. Male and female Kashiri ranging in age from 12 to 15, all on their first draft detail. Quora looked from face to fresh face. Her oldest daughter would be training just like them in another year. She watched the captain as he flipped through her papers. Maybe he'd lost the eye to a recruit. Or maybe not, he was old for this duty, which meant he was good at it. No sensible official would transfer a talented ballastier from Garrow's neck. This was where the action was. Or, rather, would be. Boardmaster Cora Thane. He groaned, the sight of the raised insignia evidently ruining his appetite for the next month. I've stopped a wardmaster. I'm sorry, ma'am. Tempted to lord over the officer, Cora remembered why she was there. It's no problem, Captain. Ruin. Training Division of the 108th, Southwestern Directorate. Don't be sorry, Ruin. You're out at the knife's point. Or close enough. Her pass indicated she was headed for Point Defiance. One of Alancier's westernmost spurs, the cone of granite punctuated the far end of the isthmus past the fortress. The continent, many said, resembled a Muntox leg. The bulk of population and industry lived in the higher elevations of the enormous hip to the east. The canal-crossed region known as the Shank Stabbed West, terminating in the Six Claws, nearly parallel mountain peninsulas reaching into the Western Sea. Each claw had a signal station at the far end, 
preparations for when the dreaded day came at last. The captain cleared his throat as he folded up the <clears> parchment. <throat> Surprised you're not back with the rest of the mucky mucks with observance day coming up, he said. It seemed like a good time to visit the front. The sentry's good eye gave a wink. Battlefront my purple behind. My days spent keeping my draftees inside the walls. The shore guard swipes anyone that's out and about for itself. Thirty years, and that's the only battle I've fought. Cora replaced the documents in her binder. She pointed to the tall gates up ahead. Is that the way? Unless you want to swim. The flying riding beasts called Yuvak were the exclusive province of the shore guard in these areas, and waterborne travel in the east-west fjords formed by the Six Claws was highly restricted. There was no access to Point Defiance but through the military camp at Garrow's Neck. Enjoy your visit, and stay ready. Stay ready, she said, taking up the reins. Prodding her Muntok back into a trot, Cora made for the western barricades, the product of hundreds of years of construction and renovation. But what caught her? I was the signal tower, standing tall between rings of the fortress. Brilliant colored lights in the belfry flashed on and off, easily visible in the late afternoon. She studied it as she passed, and remembered again why she was here. It had all begun with messages sent three years earlier through that exact relay station. And now, up ahead, she saw the source of those missives for the first time. As the mighty gate opened to permit her exit, she looked out upon the rocky trail. Half surrounded by a cloud of sea mist, Point Defiance jetted from an angry ocean. A lonely silo perched atop the promontory, blinking tiny lights in response to the faraway fortress above her. She thought for a moment about turning back, about retracing the long journey that had brought her here. If she reached a Yuvak livery before night fell, she could be back in the world she knew before anyone was the wiser. For Cora Thane, wife and mother of three, chief military administrator of Arar, and a rare Kashiri wielder of the mysterious power known as the Force, was at this moment thought to be elsewhere. Officially, she was supposed to be on a working tour of the battle armor factories on the northern slope of Alancier, not heading to a secret meeting in the middle of nowhere with someone she had never met. Behind her, the ballasteers resumed firing, their shots in syncopation with the flashing signals far ahead. Almost hypnotized by the sight and sound, she felt her future stretching ahead of her. This was something she had to do. She breathed deeply and kicked the Muntok into a run. This had better be worth it. The sun shone low over the western ocean, but Cora wasn't fooled. The darkness was out there, in that direction. The herald had come from the west, just as the currents of air and sea did in this southerly latitude. Westward lay deceit and treachery, hatred and panic. But the protectors who had created Alancier and all of Kesh had provided well for their people. The Six Claws were like talons, rocky points on which battlements had been erected. For centuries, the fjords had been busy harbors for the shore guard's patrol vessels, while its watchers on Yuvak sailed overhead. At times, all six peninsulas had been fortified and active. Cora still saw the windswept remnants of some of those earlier installations here on Point Defiance. A cluster of ruins spread out before the signal tower, and ruined they were. Clearly, the troops at Garrow's Neck had practiced demolitions here in some earlier time. Much of the outpost had been abandoned as operations had been consolidated on the wider spurs of land farther north. While not as far west as Defiance, some of the other peninsulas rose higher, offering better coverage of the harbors, and being to the north, they were better placed to guard the mass of Alancier. Since the new installations had gone in, aerial and seaborne patrols had been brought closer to the coastline. It would be a mistake for a people in hiding to accidentally awaken the destructors by ranging too far out to sea. The signal station loomed large before her an alabaster cylinder rising over a walled courtyard. Railed perches on the tower's upper level looked out in all directions, with the all-important grid of fire globes sitting on stanchions above the eastern balcony. Dismounting outside the wall, Cora found a post and tied up the Muntok. Fog's rolling in, said a gap-toothed Kashiri male in his sixties as he opened the gate. Could be a storm. 
Cora blanched upon seeing him. Tiny growths of waxy hair terminated in comical points behind his ears, and the buttons of his uniform struggled to restrain his gut. You're not Jogenhalder. Mercy, no. He's in the tower. I work with him. Inwardly, Cora breathed a sigh of relief. You're the thought crier. I am, he said through the force. And you? Cora closed her eyes and sent a telepathic response in the affirmative. She reopened her eyes quickly to see the old Kashiri smiling. Nice to meet another who has the gift, but I barely heard you. You tired? Been a long ride. Cora tensed up. It had been a long time since she'd been called upon to use the force in her job. Lately, she'd only used it to amuse her kids and to see if they possessed her rare talents. That was out of simple maternal curiosity. The induction board would eventually discover for sure which children had the talent. Heaving her duffel bag off the Muntok's back, Quora turned and proffered her document pouch. You want to see these? No need. Our friends at the fort wouldn't have let you get this far otherwise. He stepped out, bearing luggage. If things go as usual, they'll frisk me for an hour at every gate. Better go now before the officer's club closes. Exhaling, Cora placed the documents back inside her waistcoat. Bag in hand, she waved to the thought crier and shut the gate behind her. She was here, and inside. Tentatively, she crossed the lawn to the open door of the tower. She heard singing within, echoing up through the massive stone cylinder. Clutching her duffel tightly by the string handle, Cora stepped inside and tilted her head. Wooden stairs spiraled up, nearly out of sight. The wood grain of the steps didn't match, evidently having been replaced many times in the station's life. But someone had started painting them in gradually changing hues, creating the effect of a twirling rainbow. Around the circular room, she saw doorways connecting to the rest of the complex. She could smell something was cooking in a small kitchen. Two open doors led to sparsely furnished bedrooms, side by side. And a final passage led downstairs, to the singing. Hop, hurroo, for a life with you. The sea's my home, and though I roam, I'll always stay. True. Cora stood before the door. I haven't heard that one. Sailor's song. We get them here. The short-haired Kashiri said his meaty arms laden with bound volumes of parchment. You're Cora? Guilty. She dropped the duffel with a thud. Can I help you with those? No problem. He said, stepping past. Skin a robust mauve, with a closely shaved patch of silvery beard, the uniformed man was twice her weight and in incredible shape. And he's my age? He must run up and down these stairs a lot. Sorry I wasn't there to greet you. He said, setting the monstrous pile of books on a rickety table. I was down in the library in case you were late. I like to read while I eat. He stepped through a stone archway and found a glass pot simmering over spent coals. Stew's always on here. Something to eat? I'm fine, she said, leaning in the doorway. You're. Oh. He said, dropping the spoon and wiping his hands. Sorry, Jogan Halder. He shook her hand. No big city manners out here. It's okay, Cora said, smiling in spite of herself as she felt his firm grip. Suddenly self-conscious, she drew her hand back. You have a library here? Such as it is. Jogan smiled, leading her out. I get to Garrow's neck on leave, and sometimes travelers leave things to read. Not much to do here. He pointed up to where the painted steps ended. Sometimes one of the other signal stations will send news when there's no traffic. But it's a slow way to read. Cora knew what he meant. Her conversations with Jogan had started three years earlier during a routine visit to Kareba, a military supply center upstream on one of the canals that emptied into one of the bays defined by the Six Claws. 
She'd spoken to a cousin there who'd saved months of tales of the frontier transmitted to her by a signal officer in his off-duty hours. Quora had read the collection thoroughly, enchanted by the author's wordplay and honest, bruising appraisal of life at the edge of civilization. When her cousin was reassigned, Quora had sent a message through the signal station at Harar introducing herself. What had followed had transformed her life. More than a thousand messages had passed between Jogan and Quora. Mostly arriving overnight, his dispatches had awaited her when she reached her office each morning. She soon began carrying them with her throughout her rounds, leafing secretly through them to get through the drudgery of her days. Pointless distribution meetings became opportunities for her to brainstorm the responses she sent him before going home. She had struggled to make her own life sound exciting. Eventually, as trust grew, she shared her feelings about her job and household. She was thankful her access to the semaphore system was limited, lest her ranting grow unbearable. But Jogan had always been understanding, taking his long nights to craft thoughtful and eloquent responses. And now she was here, in his element. She'd imagined him many times, in his fog and shrouded outpost on the edge of the safe world. He wasn't a disappointment, and he definitely seemed to be paying attention to her. Spying the Kotrak, she removed her overcoat to reveal her dress uniform. It was necessary for her travels, but she'd left the decorations in her desk at work. She felt awkward enough without visibly outranking him in their first meeting. You met Belmer on the way out? I did. Quora said. She chuckled. <laughs> I was afraid he was you. Nope. But I do send romantic messages out for him under my name. <laughs> Just kidding. Belmer's loves are all fermented. Not exactly what you want in a thought crier at the front, is it? He doesn't drink on duty, of course. He reached for her duffel bag. Let me take that. She watched with anticipation as he placed it between the doors to the two bedchambers, almost the baggage handling equivalent of a wink. They hadn't spoken in specifics about sleeping arrangements for the week of her visit, that would be too premeditated. It had been more fun to wonder. Forgive the look of the place. We're at the end of the inspection route, and with old bachelors, you can imagine... I have three kids. You should see my place when my husband's away at work too long, she said, immediately regretting it. Your husband, Brew, isn't it? How's he doing? He's fine, Quora said, sorry she had ever invoked him. Stupid, stupid. Her eyes darted to the side. How about that tour you promised me? Happy to show you around, though there's not much to see. But first things first, Quora. Come along. Seeing him beckon for her to follow, Quora hesitated before realizing what he had in mind. Embarrassed at where her thoughts had gone, she followed him up the spiral staircase to the signal tower. She shook her head as she climbed and wondered about her mental stability. I haven't been 14 in 30 years. What in blazes is wrong with me? 2. Here's where the magic happens, Jogan said helping her into the belfry. What there is of it. Just inside the doorway facing west, a wooden stand held cylinders of various sizes. Each drum had several slate-covered wheels oriented around a central dowel, with lines dividing the circumference of each wheel into equal parts. Jogan selected one of the medium-sized drums and snapped it crossways into a holder on his workbench. With a swiftness born from routine, he scrawled a message in chalk across the cylinder, one character in each box, turning the entire drum as he reached the end of each line. Finishing, he pulled a small locking rod free from the cylinder, causing the letter wheels to rotate freely. Having reset the positions of the wheels at random, he replaced the locking rod and recorded a ten-digit number reflecting the new positions of the tumblers. No big cipher for this one, he said. Unplugging the cylinder from his workstation, he stepped out onto the eastern balcony. By the parapet stood the frame holding the massive fire globe grid, all but one of its orbs cycled inward toward their bushings, the off position. You might want to shield your eyes, he said. Cora lingered in the doorway and watched Jogan work the signal device. Cycling pulleys, he brought the grid to blazing life. 
One orange light flashed and then another, beaming far into the deepening darkness of the east. The alert signal sent, Jogan's hands darted from one control to another, opening and shuttering lights of burning white, gold, orange, and green. She'd learned what they meant once, it had been part of her basic training back home. But only an expert could send signals as fast as an experienced Alancier semaphore operator. It took Jogan all of five seconds to send the destination code and begin transmitting his missive. You're good. Practice. He said, barely looking at the drum with the scrambled text for reference. It's an awful lot of work just to say that Belmer Catton has headed off to sleep on the floor of a tavern for a week and that his relief has arrived. You're not using my name? No need. Jogan said, smiling at her even as his hands continued to work the device. You're one more anonymous warrior for the great cause. We may have a different great cause this weekend, she said to herself, hoping her blush wouldn't be noticed in the glare. Turning back inside, shielded from the searing flashes, she studied the lonely room. What with spotters, signalers, and transcriptionists, most inland signal stations had no fewer than four workers. And many had more, handling traffic in more than one direction. What had begun as an early warning system had become the logistical backbone of the state, conveying everything from weather reports to shipping updates. As decades passed without the expected foe arriving, many in authority had started using the network for personal messages, like those that had passed between her and Jogan. The network had been one of the greatest developments of modern times, but it was under ever more stress, and she expected that any minute the war cabinet would clamp down. That's fine, she thought. I'm here now. Where does the thought crier work, she asked. Sometimes here, sometimes on the balcony, or in the yard. Jogan said, returning from outside. The message finished, he wiped the cylinder clean with a damp cloth. There's a meditation room downstairs with some privacy, but it doesn't seem to matter to you folks. Right, she said, remembering. You can't use the force. I like my way of sending messages just fine. He pointed to the door beside him. Sunset? Somehow, Cora found herself on the western balcony, high above the thunderous surf. Life was moving without her, now. She wasn't making decisions anymore, not consciously. Out there, as promised, an orange blaze appeared between the low clouds and the horizon. The coral banks to the south are even nicer. We've got a rowboat. Maybe in the morning you can see. Jogan appeared next to her holding a bottle and a glass. From Belmer's stash. He poured for her. Sorry, there's only one glass. Belmer drinks from the bottle. Winking, he did just that. So this is what you guys do, she said. You sit out here all year, drinking. And writing to married women. Drinking and writing to married women, all while the great enemy lurks over the waves. She sipped and smiled. I'm a wardmaster, you know. I could report this. I'll take my chances. The sun vanished and the carpet of clouds erased the remaining sky. Feeling the wind pick up, she sidled closer to the railing where he drank. You never married? No, and you know this, he said. We covered that in message too. Cora chuckled. Her marital status had been introduced only in message 12. I suppose it's hard to think about having a family at the end of the line. The end of the line, Jogan said turning to look at the ocean. I like it. Sorry, did that offend you? Nothing inferior about being here. This is the front, he said. Grasping her shoulder, he turned her and pointed. See that buoy out there? That's the direction the Herald came from 2,000 years ago. Somewhere behind it is the greatest evil Kesh has ever seen. The devil we know. Now, I could be stationed inland, passing along other people's mundane messages, or I could be here, telling the world every night that everything is still all right. Profound, she said, 
finishing her drink. She set the glass on the ledge. You wrote me that once. Several times, she recalled. That's a good reason to be here. He nodded. Now, he said, setting down the bottle. Why are you here? Quora laughed. I was drafted, like everyone else. That's not it. He turned her away from the view and looked at her with dark, earnest eyes. What are you doing here? She stammered, taken aback by the change in his tone. What, what do you mean? I mean, a woman in your position has better things to do than come out and jaw with a lifer in the Signal Corps. I wanted to see the ocean. He smiled, but did not laugh. She exhaled and said the name. Brew. Brew. What does your husband do again? Something with the training directorate, I thought. He teaches glassblowing to the elderly. Well, that's... Cora looked away as Jogan stopped to recompose his words. I'm sure he gets a lot out of working with them. Do headaches count? Cora smiled weakly. Brew hates every minute of it. They're veterans, and while they've all been retired, they still have to do something for the cause, like we all do. So these cranky people are on the factory line and every single one thinks they outrank him. Which they might not, if Brew had any rank at all. Cora's voice trailed off. Still, he's putting people to use. All we can do, no? No, she said, shaking her head. Or yes. It might be all he can do, but he'll never. No, because he doesn't try. Brew's a good father for the kids, and he's made a decent home in spite of me being busy. But he's not the man you married anymore. Actually, he is. That's the problem. In 20 years I've gone from supply clerk to thought crier to material supervisor to ward master. Successful ward masters become mayors. I always end up hating my job, too, but every time, I find a path to something better. But Brew can't find the nerve to tell off an old fossil whose authority ended before the ancient cataclysm. Cora caught her breath. It was like her messages, but this time there wasn't a word limit to stop her. She hadn't wanted to do this, hadn't wanted to complain about Brew. It wasn't fair to him, wasn't what she'd come here to do. What had she come here to do? You know, it's not so bad if he's got the right attitude. Nothing much happens here, but there's something about being able to tell people things that I like. Every one of my reports from here... It's a little story, if told a sentence at a... Jogan didn't finish the sentence, because Cora had decided what she had come there to do. He didn't reject the kiss. Turning him so his back was against the balcony railing, she pressed against him and kissed harder. She felt overwhelming relief to be in this place, doing this, after so many months and so many words. They were done talking. Cora... The name was soft in the air. He pulled her tighter. She turned his head to brush his cheek with her lips, and opened her eyes to the ocean. And saw the giant flying blob, emerging from the fog. Jogan. The man looked at her in panic, horrified that he'd crossed a line. Seeing her eyes, though, he turned to look in the same direction. What in blazes is that? The shadowy form became clearer as it approached. Paunchy and rounded, like a raised commissary biscuit, only gigantic, as tall as the signal tower itself. Fluorescent design work gave the shape a snarling, alien face. Something was suspended just beneath the mass, a railed deck, easily the size of one of the canal packet boats. And there was something to the body's rear on either side, moving back and forth almost organically in the wind. Something was alive over there, Cora could feel the stirring in the force but the overall structure was artificial. It was an airship. There's two of them, she called, yanking at Jogan's vest and pointing. No. He yelled, pointing to the clouds just north of west. Three. For a split second, they held each other again, 
stupefied, both looking out at the vessels. What do we do? What we're supposed to do. Jogan said. He released her and dashed back inside. Wait. What are you doing? That should be an easy answer. He said, grabbing a dust-covered drum sitting alone at the very top of the wooden stand. It was the first cylinder to be inscribed for transmission when the signal station opened, centuries earlier, and it bore only one word, unscrambled, with the source identifier for point defiance at the top. There was no destination code, because the destination was everywhere. I haven't sensed any flash traffic since the typhoon that fizzled out six years ago, he said, hurrying onto the eastern balcony. I sure hope they believe me. Working the pulleys, he looked back to see her still standing in the doorway. Cora, what are you waiting for? What do you mean? You're the thought crier. The semaphore stations will get the news out only so fast. You've got to call out. She froze, suddenly realizing where she was, and what she had been doing, when the news came. She'd worked so hard to keep everything secret. Her voice cracked. But. I'm not supposed to be here. Cora! She had no choice. This was it. This was it, if the pronoun had any meaning in a lancier. The feeling in the force was stronger, now. Fowler. Darker. Cora knew, now, why she was here. Though it wasn't necessary to face the mainland, she turned, shut her eyes, and concentrated hard. Yes, there were mines out there to the populous northeast, waiting to relay her call. One word, the word the Alanciari had feared for two thousand years since the Herald had washed up on an island near their shores. Sith. 3. Edel Vray had expected many sensations on seeing land ahead. The one he hadn't planned on was regret. Twenty-five years of work had gone into this day, the greatest moment in the history of humanity on Kesh. At last, Edel, High Lord of the Tribe and Captain of the Sith Expedition, had done it. He had discovered the new world, but few were there to see it. Someone should be recording this, the captain thought. Too bad we didn't bring a scribe. Adele gripped the railing at the gondola's prow and squinted into the eastern night. The telescopes his kashiri at the construction yards had supplied had been of little use. He'd expected to see more lights on the new continent, as Omen's cams had seen in its suicidal plunge to Kesha's surface. But the only sight had been inky shapes rising from the surface, like ribs poking through a shriveled corpse. Adjust speed. He called to his crew astern. We are kilometers away yet. We don't know what the winds on shore will be like. Yes, Captain. Idel's regrets vanished. Captain. The title Yaru Corson had arrived on Keshwith. There had been no captains of anything among the Sith in two thousand years, no vessels to command larger than the Gornick Shell pontoons farmers ran on the rivers. It had always been assumed that the designer of the method for crossing the sea would have the honor of leading the expedition, but on the near side of fifty, Adel felt fortunate to have finally made it. He'd been a young man when the quest began, after all. Thin and fresh-faced, with neatly coiffed blonde hair, he'd been a member of Golden Destiny, the most forward-thinking of the tribe factions before the crisis. He liked to think now that he was still a young man, he'd grown into his features, and he cut a dashing figure as the chief engineer of the realm. But in the last decade, he despaired of ever reaching his goal. So much had gone wrong. Distance was the problem. The Kashiri whom Corson encountered lived on Keshta, a continent alone in the ocean. That's what the Kashiri described, and that's what the Sith found in their own travels. But their collective knowledge of the map had been limited by something, the stamina of an Yivak. As the Neshtavar had before them, the Sith flew many exploratory flights from Keshta's shores, those who returned had reported sea in every direction, and no islands upon which to alight. Reefs were visible in places not far beneath the waves, perhaps there had even been dry land there at one time. But if any rider had actually crossed the ocean on Yuvak back, none had ever reported it. 
The Sith, of course, knew their world to be round, even the native Kashiri had figured that one out on their own. But it appeared that Keshta was all there was. The great map that Grand Lord Corson kept beneath the temple had removed not one, but two matters from doubt. There actually was more land, and a lot of it. But the diagram also depicted how far away it was, disappointingly, desperately far. The western route was shorter, but it fought the currents. East was the only option. Now there was a Grand Lord in Tav again, and Adele had been friendly with him since the older man's time as curator of the Palace Museum. Varner Hiltz wasn't mathematical, but he respected and employed people who were, and as a teenager, Adele had spent many days studying with them the construction techniques of the grand edifices. So as soon as the restoration had begun, Hiltz had charged Adele with solving the transit problem. And solving it forever, a single trip wouldn't do. It had to be replicable, and ready for mass production. The other continent, Corson had shown, was inhabited. Occupation had to follow discovery. Years of experiments followed. Boats were out of the question, the jungle forests of Keshta yielded nothing that would survive the rough waves. Hijarbo plants were plentiful, but their shoots only barely protected Kashiri farmers from rain. They didn't withstand the pressures facing a ship's hull. Vaso and the few other hardwoods from the far interior were too dense to float. Others were too rubbery. Adele spent the second decade of his work in the study of those materials, hoping to find something that would make the trip possible. Failure heaped upon failure, and many aides grew disgusted with him and became rivals, testing their own plans. Hiltz had made him one of the youngest High Lords in history to ensure that he had full access to resources, but Adele had no time for court politics, or family. He refused to yield. His ancestors had crossed the stars. The Force could negate the rules of nature. A true Sith should be able to cross a planetary puddle. The solution that ultimately struck him was far afield from engineering, and resembled alchemy to his peers. Perhaps it was. The hot seams of the Cecil Spire emitted a variety of noxious gases, including methane. Using glass vessels shaped by Kashiri crafters, Adele and his team trapped methane and used a simple water catalyst to isolate hydrogen, the lightest element known. With a production line set up, Adele developed structures the gas could carry aloft. Again, the Kashiri artisans were up to the task fashioning an amazingly thin containment fabric that stiffened against pressure. Adele's rising bell shape proving the most stable, and he added a gondola crafted from several layers of lattice to Jarbo, just strong enough to carry the weight of a crew and their provisions. What would not float on water would float on air. Three years had passed since he'd gotten that far, and then despair had fallen again. There was no method of controlling direction, exposing the balloons to all the violent whims of the ocean winds. The jet streams here in Kesha's southern hemisphere could provide a mighty assist, but they proved untamed. In the south, a change in the moods of the Cecil Spire and the other volcanoes could send a flyer anywhere. Sometimes the south lies carried riders up and up, presumably releasing them to perish upon the mighty polar ice pack. And farther north, the equatorial route just sent riders to a watery death in the doldrums, or so they assumed, for none had ever returned from any of the test flights. At last, earlier this year, with his enemies protesting against his extravagant expenditures, Adele had had a revelation. The craft didn't need to be smaller, but larger. Large enough to support the weight of two or more Yuvak, suspended in harnesses aft, beneath the keel of the gondola. No Yavak could make the crossing under its own power without tiring, but carried aloft, the beasts could rest, be fed, and even sleep when they weren't needed. When they were, their beating wings provided enough propulsion to control direction, provided the pilot tending them sensed the wind patterns properly. Adele stepped to the gondola's right side and looked back down through the darkness at one of the bleeding creatures bobbing in its skeletal yoke. It was as confused as ever about its predicament, but flapping its wings on command. Looks like Starbird's doing his bit, Idel said. How's Port doing? Port's happy and fed, replied Pepin, the Kandra's combination Yuva Krangler and pilot. Just tell her where you want to go. The captain smiled. 
Yvak would indeed take them across the ocean, just not in a way anyone had imagined. Idel felt the wind picking up as he headed amidships. A salty breeze. They'd been descending, thanks to controlled releases of gas, since they'd spotted land minutes earlier. To the north, he saw the two companion vessels, identical to his, emerging from the clouds. Good. His little fleet had made it, every ship. The Kandra, the Lilia, and the Dan Itra. Idel had despaired at the naming of the airships, which honored grand lords from around when the time of the rock began. It was a recent trend in the thinking of Grand Lord Hiltz. Years had been spent renewing the tribe's connection with its founders, now, their leader felt, it was necessary to rehabilitate other figures from its history. Even those who had, by action or inaction, contributed to the chaos that followed them. In her long-ago tenure, Kandra Katai had been memorable for no other deed than closing the local zoo. And yet here she was, a soapstone facsimile of the woman fastened outside the gondola's hull. The decorations weren't part of Adele's designs for the vessels. If his ship needed to lose weight to gain elevation, the Honorable Lady Kandra would be the first thing to take the plunge. Tiny red lights appeared on the decks of Lilia and Dan Itra, lightsabers, flashing on and off. Adele returned the signal. <laughs> They'd all seen the land and were slowing. Adele didn't really know the other captains who had been appointed, more political nonsense, but they would follow his lead. Their ships, like his, carried ten-person crews, captain, pilot, clairvoyant, and five warriors, plus two Kashiri ambassadors. Familiar purple faces might come in handy if they had to make contact with the natives. But contact wasn't the plan for this trip. Instead, Idel planned an overflight reconnaissance of Kesh to Major, followed by a return, crossing the relatively small ocean to his homeland's western coast. A larger force already being prepared would follow, once they knew Corson's map was no fantasy. That was fine with Idel. Leave the fighting to others, he would take the glory of discovery, sailing Kandra straight to Tov, where all his doubters could see him arriving from the sunset. It was about time. Seated ahead of the Yvak tender, a dark-skinned woman in her twenties spoke up. Send the impression, Captain. Do it. Idel watched as Tamor, one of the more able Sith at thought projection through the Force, concentrated. She wasn't trying to project any more than a feeling at this juncture, the sensation of success, of accomplishment. Distance wasn't necessarily a bar to users of the Force but no one in the tribe had ever tried to send a message around the world before. They'd keep to simple emotions now. There'd be time to experiment with more, later. Done, Tamor said, smirking as if to remind the others that she'd just done something unprecedented for the tribe on Kesh. Idel rolled his eyes and returned to the prow. This was how it was with the Sith. Every gathering, no matter how small, became a talent show. He suddenly respected Yaru Corson a lot more. Starships must have been nightmares to run. No wonder Omen had a private cabin for the captain. Idel had wished for one several times on the voyage already. Something Kandra also lacked was a good forward observation post, he thought again as he reached for one of the sturdily wound leather cables connecting the gondola to the gas envelope. It wasn't a problem for a daring Sith willing to shimmy up, as he was, but he had already added it to his mental list of design needs for the future. Gloved hands on the cord, he started pulling himself up, only to be interrupted by a call from behind. Captain. Idel looked back in the dark to see Tamor frowning. What now? There's a lot going on here, the telepath said, fingers splayed around her temples. In this place. A lot of emotions. A lot of energy. Her brow furrowed. The captain chortled. You're just reading us, Tamar. No, High Lord. It's out there. She pointed ahead. Idel squinted. I don't know what you mean. He climbed the cable and looked forward. The lumps in the east were more than islands, the tips of long peninsulas, with harbors between. Structures were visible atop various promontories straight lines in the milky blackness. 
Leaning outward and craning his neck, he saw tiny, multicolored lights peeking through the haze that covered the inland regions. The lights flickered, changed, and went out. Where are the bright cities Yaru Corson wrote about? Swaying in the wind, Adele tried to focus through the force, to see if he could feel anything Tamor had. He sensed only tension, apprehension, anticipation, and excitement, all of which could have been coming as easily from his lusty Sith shipmates as from anywhere else. He looked back to his crew. We don't have anything to worry. At once a flash appeared over his shoulder. In the sky a kilometer to the north, Lilia exploded. Momentarily blinded, Adele nearly lost his grip on the cable. Catching himself, the captain twisted around and struggled to focus his eyes. Lilia's gas envelope had been completely replaced by a burgeoning blossom of flames, and her gondola was nowhere to be seen. All oh, stop! Also to port but nearer to Kandra, Dan Itra wobbled and turned. Idel felt a lurch, too, as Kandra's steering Yvak decided they wanted to be anywhere else. Pepin, get control of those animals! The airship quaked. Idel's shipmates rose from their positions, some seeking to help the navigator, others gawking at the blast, which had now resolved itself into a hot ashen shower, peppering the ocean far below. Idel's mind raced. It's just lightning! He yelled. Everyone knew how volatile hydrogen was, danger from electrical charge was always a risk. He thought back on the wind he'd felt. There was no obvious storm brewing, but maybe this had to do with the approaching land, and the weather here. It was why they brought three ships. Breathing deeply, he felt better for a moment. Until he looked down again and saw the bright, blazing missile lancing upward from the land. Three meters long, its head afire, the black javelin arced toward Dan Itra. Idel closed his eyes this time, but the superheated shock wave threw him from his perch. The High Lord slammed awkwardly to the deck, his right knee smashing straight through the top level of Hijarbo flooring. Kandra spun now, straining the cables connecting the gondola to the balloon. As Adele struggled to right himself, he heard the Yuvak scream. No, not Kandra's Yuvak, he saw as he reached the railing. In the sky below, Dan Itra's damaged gondola tumbled violently downward, end over end, followed almost gently through the furious cloud by a rent portion of the canvas envelope. Adele clambered halfway across the railing, screaming through the force for Dan Itra's occupants to bail out, only to see another pike fired from the ground strike the flailing wreckage midair, shattering it to bits. <laughs> Sensing the deaths of his fellow Sith, Adele felt something else. The force had been used against him. Such precision firing? It was the only way. But whoever heard of force using Kashiri? Captain! They're firing at us now! Below, the air itself seemed to scream. The captain clutched the railing and swore. It was indeed a historic moment. Like Yaru Corson, Adel Vray and his Sith had made first contact with the natives of a new continent. But this time, the natives were stronger. Four. The massive ballista on Point Vigilance fired again, its mechanical recoil echoing across the harbor to the signal station on Defiance. Yes! Yes! Jogan yelled from the station tower, leaping in place. His excitement rattled the northern balcony more than the explosions had. Get him! Cora sagged against the railing, mystified at the scene to the northwest. A rancid haze high aloft was the only clue to the previous existence of the first airship. The second had left a bilious pillar of smoke, twisting downward as it chased its unhappy payload. Sith. Sith. Cora cursed herself for failing to sense their evil approaching. Her job, her whole civilization, was about staying alert, and she'd let herself become preoccupied. Her fault. But then, who had known what to look for, anyway? No one alive on a Lancier had ever been touched by Sith evil. Not until a few minutes earlier, 
when she had opened her mind to send the warning message to the mainland. She felt them then, writhing tendrils of darkness, reaching into the night, supremely confident of her inferiority, and of their ultimate success. Success. She'd almost felt the word, curdling in an alien mouth. Two of the airships had fallen after that, but who knew how many more the Sith had? Who knew they had them at all? Airships weren't mentioned in the Keshta Chronicles, the tome that said all that had ever been known about the dark side of the world. If the Sith had airships, why hadn't they used them before? Were they new? Was this a test? If it was, the forces of a Lancier were passing it. Over the waters, another weapon fired, hurling a whistling cloud into the night. That's right! That's right! Jogan hooted. Take that back home with you! Quora looked up suddenly. Home. She bolted back inside the belfry. Immediately she slammed into something painfully solid. They doused the few glow lights in the belfry, as per general orders, but she'd forgotten where Jogan's workbench was. Now it was on her, or she was on it. Quora rolled, struggling to untangle her leg. Jogan's styluses tumbled from their holders, clattering onto the floor beside her. She swore, but her voice was lost in the sound of another launch from the opposite coast. Outside, Jogan cheered. Blast it! Blast it! Cora thought the same words. She ground her teeth and kicked the table free. Turning, she scrambled over the fallen goods and stumbled toward the staircase. Cora, You've got to see this! Poking his head inside, Jogan saw her vanish into the black hole of the stairwell. Cora. The gondola quaked in the darkness. Hurry, fools! All the occupants of Kandra were moving now, hurling provisions over the side in a desperate attempt to put some elevation between the airship and the ballisti below. The fortification overlooking the harbor fairly bristled with weapons, Adele saw, but they had a limited range. To avoid a fiery fate, a Sith could starve a little. But the tribe had to know what lurked here. Tamor! Send the alarm! Glancing aft, Adele saw the telepath kneel. There was no concentrating here, not with Kandra buffeting so violently against the crazed Yuvak's exertions. The woman steadied herself against the gondola frame with one hand, <coughs> and screamed as white geysers seemed to erupt from beneath her feet, tearing woman and hijarbo flooring to pieces. Adele goggled as Tamor fell. With Kandra lurching again, he leapt across the new gaping hole and the flooring to land at the side of what was left of the clairvoyant. There was no saving Tamor, he saw, her body was lacerated with dozens of shining stones. He gawked as he recognized the projectiles. Diamonds! And Yvak screeched past, soaring upward into the night sky behind Kandra. Idel thought one of his own wailing creatures had gotten loose, until the Yvak seemingly wheeled in midair and turned in pursuit. There was no mistaking, it was the source of the fatal shots. And now as it approached, Adele could see through the murk a Kashiri rider, propping a long tube on his shoulder. Look out! As Adele dived back over the opening, a mechanical snap sounded from behind. A cloud of shining stones arced upward, some nuggets punching through the rear of the gondola, others whizzing out of sight above. Beneath, Kandra's own Yvak who had never stopped screaming, went abruptly silent. The captain watched as the attacker soared ahead to be joined by two others, similarly armed. Idel's eyes widened. The Kashiri had an air force. Cora missed every other step heading down before finally leaping over the railing into the darkness. Landing safely on the floor of the tower, at least the force had been helpful to her in that, she darted into the kitchen, 
not even remembering what she was looking for. Jogan clambered quickly down the steps. Cora! I've got to go, she said as she dashed heedlessly from room to room. Where's my pack? I need my pack. Jogan watched, puzzled, from his perch on the stairs as she charged past in a frenzy. He pointed toward the floor in front of the bedroom doors. Fumbling in the dark for the bag, Cora lifted. Fabric tore loudly as she caught the string of the duffel underfoot, and she fell to the floor again with a muffled thud. Clothing spilled from the ripped bag. Another clamor from outside. Jogan looked up into the heights, torn between watching the destruction of the ancient invaders and a harried woman scrambling in the dark to recover her laundry. He didn't wait long to decide. Hopping off the staircase, he found her on her hands and knees, futilely stuffing items into a bag that no longer was. He knelt behind her. Cora, you don't have to go anywhere. We've sent our messages. We're safe here. You're safe here, she said, clawing for the last of her wayward underthings. Looking left, she found it, in the bemused signal officer's hand. I'm not safe here, because I'm not here. Jogan gave her a blank look. What do you mean? She ripped the garment from his hand. My husband thinks I'm touring the northern slope right now. I don't get out much. Is that what they call what we were doing? She returned a glare that assured him she was not amused. Outside, another wooden crack told of more woe for the invading Sith. He watched as she folded over what was left of the pouch. But you said Bruce not in the military. I don't think he'll find out. Clutching her belongings between her arm and torso, Cora whirled and grabbed Jogan's hands. She spoke urgently. Jogan, meeting you is one of the best things that's ever happened to me. You're a very hopeful and trusting person, she said. She turned his hands over and clutched them more tightly. But that out there is the biggest thing that has ever happened and you and I were out on the balcony watching it. I was the one who sent the thought signal. She dropped his hands and stood. There are going to be a lot of people here soon, she said, gesticulating wildly. And everyone on Kesh will know who was here when the Sith came. I can't be here. It's history. Keep it. Jogan stood. Cora. If the state dispatched you, they already know you're here. That's just it. They didn't send me. She barged past him toward the door. Lit from behind by the low light from outside, she looked back at him plaintively. I wrote the letter of transit here myself. I borrowed the travel supervisor's seal to stamp it. You can do that? Not really. It helps that he's 77, and too well connected to be sent to work in. I don't know, a glass factory. There wasn't a relief order for Belmer? Belmer. Her mind raced. No, she hadn't told her name to Belmer, the thought crier. He would be heading back here now, too, unless the forces at Garrow's neck stopped him. She thought back on the captain and his gunners. Did he remember her name? They, too, should be marching up the trail any minute. How was she supposed to get past them? I've got to go. She ran through the doorway. Rising bell damaged! Pepin's warning was no surprise to Adele. Hydrogen hissed from punctures in the gas bag. Not good he thought though at least the attackers buzzing around there were three now didn't have the fire tip javelins that had killed their companions but Kandra was descending again soon to be back within range of the balusters there was no choice they had to deflate the balloon before someone else did Adele forced his way forward there was a hawser dangling there somewhere pitching in the dark which would vent the envelopes in an orderly manner if he got the time. Outside, the Yiva Criders turned for another pass. Warriors, port and starboard. Prepare to deflect fire. No lightsabers. Use the force. 
This was no time to learn whether igniting a lightsaber would touch off an explosion. Two Yavak converged from either side, their riders unleashing a hail of shining pellets into the night. But even as the Sith warriors gestured to block the spray, the third Yavak rider made his appearance, diving headlong toward the gondola. The forward section sundered under the brunt of the suicidal attack, smashing the graven image of Kandra Katai backward along with the rest of the prow. Two crew members died instantly from the impact. Idel seized a railing amidships just as the forward cables snapped. What remained of the gondola flipped downward, held to the sighing balloon only by the rear supports. Another warrior and an unanchored Kashiri ambassador disappeared into the darkness. What remained of Kandra hurtled downward, the balloon slinging its hostages violently beneath it. Idel saw faces spinning above him, all clinging desperately to the scraps. Below, the dark harbor yawned wide, as if to devour them. From beyond, he heard the telltale whistle start again, growing more shrill by the second. He screamed for his crew to fall free from the ship, and finally let go himself, surrendering his dream to an eruption of heat and light. As the surf crashed around the southernmost peninsula, chaos continued to rage to the north. Every launcher on the Six Claws fired wildly into the sky, searching for the last airship. Jogan stood in the open gate, holding his repeating ballista in two hands. A hefty construct of ossified wood and elastic bands under high tension, it was standard issue for the front. But while the long-awaited war was finally going on across the harbor to the north, Quora was wandering the knoll looking every which way. Her torn bag sat on the ground, unattended. Cora, what's wrong? Jogan asked, striding over. My Muntok, she said, waving a stretch of leather cord. Blasted thing chewed through its tether and ran off. Jogan knelt and looked at the tracks in the purple sand. The explosions spooked it. Can you call it? I would if I knew its name. I checked it out at the corral in Tandrai. You didn't get its name? I was only going to have it for a while. Do you get to know Rental Muntox? Jogan looked at her in bafflement. And your job is to keep Arar organized? Sorry, it's my first affair. Cora turned to further argue the point, only to sense a stirring in the force. Feeling the shadow fall across Jogan before she saw it, she reached out to shove him telekinetically. Too late. An organic mass slammed into the sandy slope, flailing as it struck the surface. Thrown to the ground by the impact, Cora stumbled, and looked straight into the lifeless green eye of a behemoth. And Yivak, she yelled, struggling to get to her feet. She reached through the darkness, feeling her way around the creature. Jogan. Are you all right? Over her shoulder to the northeast, the last remaining balloon exploded thunderously over the harbor. Cora paid no mind, feeling around the mammoth corpse until she found Jogan, his frame pinned under the creature's weighty tail. Violet face lit by the detonation, Jogan looked up in a daze, blood trickling from his lips. I think I found your animal. <clears throat> but I thought you said you rented a Muntak, not an Yuvak. Five. The clouds broke, and the sun again mirrored through the glass spires of Tov. Idel scaled the marble steps to the capital, alone. No escort had greeted him, no parade marked his arrival. Inside, in the atrium where three great factions had battled a quarter century earlier, Adele found the tribe working in unison. Sith lords and sabers huddled over a replica of Corson's secret map, set up as one enormous table in the middle of the room. Adele had looked on it many times in planning his journey, a journey now completed. My lords and sabers, I have returned. No one stirred at the table. He called again, and again. Finally, the lords dispatched an underling. Not even an apprentice, 
but a mere Tyro, a third Adele's age. The youngling sneered. What do you want? I have news, Adele said, straightening. I've been to the new continent and returned in triumph. How did you triumph exactly? I got us there. I proved it existed. Old news, the conquest is well underway. A gap opened between the lords standing with their backs to him. Adele saw through the opening that the map table was populated with dozens of markers signifying Sith forces and the airships that brought them. Adele's brow furrowed. I didn't expect you to invade so quickly. The Tyro said nothing. Very well. Adele said, stepping forward. I'm prepared to advise. No. The Tyro ignited a lightsaber, blocking his way. Ahead, the gap between the planners closed so Adele could no longer see the table. He protested. I belong here. I confirmed the continent existed. So? Someone would have done it. I invented the airships which we can build without you. But I am High Lord of the Tribe of the Sith. A true Sith would have done something, not merely look around. You're a tinkerer. No more. Two hulking guards, previously unseen, grabbed Adele from behind. Throw him out. He doesn't belong here. <gasps> Adele gasped and opened his eyes to the night. Clutching the wet sands, he heaved seawater from his lungs. How long had he been out, he wondered, to dream. It felt like a long time, but it couldn't have been more than a few minutes. Looking west along the jagged coastline, he saw four of his companions similarly beached and scrambling from the harbor. A kilometer to the northeast, the remains of Kandra still blazed on the water. Unseen, he and his party had dropped due north of the signal station. The balloon had carried the wreckage of the gondola farther east. Squinting, he saw Yuvak buzzing over the remains, while lights moved on the northern shore across the harbor. They don't know we're over here yet, he thought. We have a chance. Idel stood rockily. Bruised and waterlogged but otherwise unhurt, he staggered up the shoreline to meet the others who had survived. Pepin, the Yuvak tender, Ulbrich and Jans, two of the warriors and one of the Kashiri, whose name didn't matter. With Adele, they were five. Was this all that remained, from an expedition of thirty? Climb! He said, pointing up a stony tumble-down. Above, atop the western summit, sat a tall white tower ringed by a high wall. Shelter, or more enemies? He didn't know, but the compound was much smaller than the one on the northern peninsula, and if anyone had fired missiles from here, they weren't doing it now. Don't use the lightsabers, he whispered. Darkness was ever the Sith's friend, but particularly now. The warriors reached the top of the rise first. Idel heard a loud snap. Hi, Lord. Idel scrambled up to see Ulbrich on the ground, clutching a gushing thigh wound. Meters ahead, a uniformed Kashiri woman crouched behind the corpse of an Yuvak and fired glistening shards from an exotic weapon. The shots just missed Jans, who dived for cover behind a ruined hut. Idel heard the projectiles shatter on impact. Glass? He realized, like little shicker blades. And even more dangerous, as Ulbrich's Mona tested. The woman spotted Idel and turned her weapon on him. The High Lord leapt just in time. How many more bolts were in that compartment? He didn't want to find out. Hitting the ground, he cupped his hand and ripped at the surface through the force, returning the Kashiri's fire with a spray of sand. The woman was ready for that, but her weapon refused to fire again. Idel went for the shikar he kept in his belt. Only to be punched violently by an unseen power. Idel's knees buckled underneath him, and he fell backward, dropping the blade. The woman was on it in half a second, grabbing the weapon and lunging. He caught her arm as she pressed it down, and saw her eyes. Wider and set farther apart than any Kashiri eyes he'd ever seen, and full of an angry fear. Drawing strength from her emotions, Idel heaved mightily. 
The woman tumbled backward, losing her grip on the dagger. When she landed, she found Pepin and Jans looming overhead. Gloved Sith hands grabbed at her, wrestling her to the ground. Reaching his feet, Adele looked at their attacker. The Kashiri woman looked to be about his age. She wore a vest rod of a leather he'd never seen before, almost an armor. The dead Yavak behind her he recognized as unlucky starboard, from the Kandra, and near him lay an incapacitated male Kashiri, dressed as the woman was except for an overcoat half swaddled around his body. Adele looked up to the tower, beyond the wall. Had anyone seen the melee? He signaled to his surviving Kashiri ambassador to see to Ulbrich. I'll deal with this one, he said, recovering his shikar and stepping toward the injured male. Don't touch him, you filthy Sith. All gawked at their conscious prisoner. Idel stammered, What? What did you say? Struggling against her captors, the woman spoke again. I said, Don't touch him, you. I heard what you said, Idel said, motioning for Pepin to cover the Kashiri's mouth. I'm just surprised to hear you say it. No one had known what language to expect from the natives of the hidden continent. The best that he'd hoped for was an ancient Kashiri dialect. Had there been some prehistoric interchange between the cultures, his ambassador was familiar with several variants. But what she was speaking, heavily accented as it was, was the language that the crew of Omen had brought to Kesh. Calming down, the silver-haired woman looked up at Pepin and spoke in that language again. You want to release me? Pepin did a double take. Oh, don't tell me. Yes. Idel said, golden eyes filling with wonder. I was right. I thought it on the ocean, and again when I saw her fight. These Kashiri know how to use the Force. Or at least this one does. He looked back at the bizarre wooden gun lying in the sand. They have several secret weapons. We prepared for you, the prisoner said, pinned to the ground. Prepared for us? How do you even know us? Idel looked through the darkness at the compound wall. Who else is here? A whole detachment. Idel snorted. A lie. Finally, a break. The Kashiri here may have use of the Force, but this woman didn't have much built up in the way of mental defenses. That boded well. Your name is Cora, I think, and you're alone. Cora glowered at him and trembled. To the side, her male Kashiri companion coughed, <coughs> waking up. Her eyes darted in his direction. You don't want him to die, Idel said. Fine, I can use that. Take them both inside the tower, quickly. Careful with him, Cora said. Your blasted Yuvak landed on him and broke his ribs. You brought the creature down on yourselves. He cracked his knuckles. You're about to bring a lot more down on you. I don't think so, Cora said as she was jerked upright by her captors. You saw what happened out there. You'll never get past our defenses. Oh, I think we will. Idel pointed to the opening in the compound wall. You left the gate wide open for us, you see. It would take two to bring in the bulky injured native, Idel saw. He suddenly remembered his own injured warrior. In the shadows of the structure, Cora's victim slumped woozily against the shoulder of Adele's Kashiri flunky. A makeshift bandage around Ulbrich's right leg was completely saturated with blood. What's his condition? Whatever your name is. I am Telpa, High One. The Kashiri scholar responded. Saber Ulbrich has many splinters in his leg. We may have to move quickly. Can he walk? Albrick gritted his teeth in pain. Not easily, High Lord, the young Sith said. I don't think so. Idel looked at the warrior and then back at Cora. He smiled at her and spun, <laughs> igniting his lightsaber and decapitating Albrick with a crimson flash. Telpa avoided the stroke that wasn't meant for him, but the Kashiri aide couldn't avoid the mess. Hide the body, Idel ordered, deactivating his weapon. This spot was sheltered from sight of the harbor, so no one had been able to see the act, other than his intended audience. Cora sputtered in horror. 
He was one of your own. Yes. Adele said mildly as he passed through the gate. Don't forget that. He looked back at his remaining trio of companions. Put the mail downstairs in the tower. I'm going to the top to have a look around. The others will be here soon, Pepin said. Then we do it quickly. We have to know what's about. Bind the woman and bring her upstairs too. She may be able to tell me what I'm looking at. A lightsaber. Bound and sitting against Jogan's overturned workbench, Quora stole glances at the Sith leader rummaging in the belfry, and at the stubby weapon attached to his belt, gently reflecting the light from the glow lamp he carried. Lightsabers had been described in the Keshta Chronicles, and there was even a rumor that one existed in a Lancier, brought there by the Herald, long ago. If such a thing was, it sat in the most secret archives of the land, buried underground beside the War Cabinet's forward headquarters in Seuss Mintry. She wondered if the relic still worked, as the human's weapon had. A magical pillar of energy, which did not fall apart on striking something. Surely the Sith were the destructors of legend. Or their minions. Or their creations. The Chronicles had also described humans, but nothing could have prepared her for the differences among humans. Such variety in skin tones and hair color, compared with the purple-complected Kashiri. It was hard to believe Adele, with his sun-colored hair, belonged to the same species as the female Pepin and her shocking red mane. They weren't unattractive as monsters went, but the Chronicles had warned the Alanciari about that fact, too. The Sith leader loomed impatiently over his assistant. Have you found anything, Telpa? No, High Lord. The older male replied, sifting notes on the floor not far from where she sat. Telpa unnerved Quora most of all. He was Kashiri, and yet not quite, with a lower forehead and a slightly narrower face. Not a distant branch of the Kashiri tree, but one removed from hers. Had the humans all come from different places, to look so distinct? And why would a Kashiri be here, helping the Sith that enslaved him? She whispered. You don't have to obey them, Telpa. Kashiri here are free. Telpa looked at her blankly, uncomprehending. Ignore her. Adele barked. I need to know the proper signal to send. Quora smirked. On reaching the belfry, Adele had gone from balcony to balcony, studying the nighttime scene outside. It had clearly unnerved him. Only ocean blackness to the west and south, armed searchers on the harbor to the north. And along the peninsula to the east, Troops were mustering outside the gates of the fortress at Garrow's Neck, preparing to head up the trail toward them. From what the Sith said, the fire globes had been lit there and at all the fortresses to the north, to aid the scouring forces. A good sign, she thought. The Alanciari were no longer afraid of more airships coming in, and were mopping up. The only thing that had seemed to go the Sith leader's way was the arrival of two more humans, Warriors evidently cast out from the airship just as he was. They'd emerged, uninjured, from the harbor near the western tip of Point Defiance, and brought his number up to six. But if he wanted to prevent the arrival of the troops from the east, his time was running out. The signal, Telpa! The signal! I told you before, I know the all-clear code, Quora piped up. Standing outside by the signal apparatus, Adele looked in at her and sneered. I don't think I'd trust the signal you'd send. Your choice, she said. He'd brought her upstairs thinking that by having Jogan in his power, he'd get her cooperation. But even with his leverage, the Sith were nothing if not suspicious, she saw. Adele stomped back into the belfry and stared angrily at the stand with the signal cylinders. In an outburst of force power, he smashed it against the stone wall. Good, she thought. He's cracking. I am not, he said, turning to face the south. Through the open doorway, he saw something far on the horizon. He quickly stepped out. Telpa, over here. You see what I see? The Kashiri slave joined his master at the ledge. A ship, sir? Quora winced. Only shore guard vessels worked the western sea, 
but the harvester fleet worked the coral banks in the southern passage. Dropping massive stone kedges to fight the fast current, the ships and their divers went out for weeks at a time. They weren't supposed to work this far west, she knew, but captains behind on harvesting their quotas of seafood were known to cut corners. It's good, Idel said, pointing southeast. You see where it is. I bet they can't see the signal tower on that fortress near us at all. He slapped Telpa on the shoulder. Quickly, let's go. Get her downstairs. Forcing Quora up, the slave tightened the cord binding her wrists behind her back and pushed her ahead. Quora looked down into the gaping maw of the stairwell and saw an opportunity. It would be easy to step off and plunge to her death. It was, in horrible fact, her responsibility now. No Alanciari could assist the Sith in their invasion plans. She'd already given too much away, just by opening her mouth. She took a step into the air, her boot hovering over the emptiness. Something had to be done. No. She thought of her children at home, and of Jogan, hurt and perhaps dying downstairs. No, there had to be a reason she'd been drawn here now, of all times. And there was hope. Troops were coming. Her marriage might not survive their arrival, but neither would the murderous humans. Newly determined, she tromped down the stairs, followed by Telpa and his master. The recently arrived warriors emerged from the basement, arms laden with books and scrolls, just as Jogan had been. Archives, High Lord. Out here? Idel regarded the parchment stash. Bring them. They could be of use. Cora barely stifled a laugh. She imagined what was in Jogan's library. Half of them were probably adventure stories or romances. Suddenly reminded, she looked to the side. From his living quarters, Jogan groaned. Idel shoved her toward Jogan's room. Don't get comfortable. Jogan certainly wasn't comfortable, she saw. The Sith had dumped him on the floor, completely ignoring his bed. But there was more color in his face now. He'd slipped into shock when the Yuvak struck him, it had taken all her force skills to keep him alive. She knelt beside him. With her hands tied behind her, all she could do was kiss his bruised cheek. Groggily, Jogan recognized her. This is not how I imagined getting you into my bedroom, he said, slurring his words. Hush, now. Jogan heard the alien voices outside and tried to rise, fighting the pain. She nudged him back down. He puffed, spent from the effort. Are those... the Sith? Yes, she whispered, caressing the side of his face with hers. But they're not happy right now. We just have to wait. No more waiting, said Adele, standing in the doorway above them. He smirked. A shame to interrupt such a loving pair, but we found your boat outside. We're about to take another trip. All of us. Six. The clouds broke, and the sun again mirrored through the glass spires of Tov. I can't see a cursed thing, the old man said, shielding his eyes. All this blasted glass wasn't such a good idea. Yes, Grand Lord. A solemn Kashiri clapped her hands, and another aide pulled a silken cord. On the roof of the Capitol building, workers on standby lowered dark curtains over the stained glass windows of the atrium dome. Too hot in here, their master growled, wiping non-existent sweat from his ragged brow. I'm going to my office. Yes. Grand Lord. The attendants bearing the fans stepped back into the alcoves, allowing him to pass. Varner Hiltz, supreme leader of the Lost Tribe of the Sith on Kesh, was heading back to the little room where he'd spent half his life. And why not? He was still caretaker as well as Grand Lord. The room was his, as all rooms were now. If he wanted to sit in front of an old desk buried under ancient texts and sip his brew, he could. Lately, all he'd wanted was privacy. His major responsibilities, as he saw them, were long since discharged. 
He'd returned the tribe to stability and restored the building he'd loved to its former splendor. The rest was trivial. The octogenarian had lost interest in the day-to-day -day running of the tribe, and in the great mission he had set his people upon twenty-five years earlier. There were others to handle those things. His consort, Ileana, still robust at forty-nine, had her hands full managing politics. The caretaker Grand Lord was still a revered figure for most, but among the Sith, even a loaf of bread would develop enemies if placed upon a throne. No one had been so irreverent as to challenge him directly, but Hiltz wasn't so naive as to think he'd always be given a pass. Though if he got any older, he probably wouldn't be able to tell the blade that struck him from any of his other pains. But those in power are the makers of traditions, and there, Hiltz found the unique opportunity that got him up in the mornings. A quarter century had passed since the last reading of Yarrow Corson's testament in Tov, and it was time for it again. But with the destruction of the ancient recording device, the spectral Corson would never again deliver the message aloud. Despite the damage to the archives during the horrible riots of the Great Crisis, the text of the testament still existed. The libraries in Oreg and Elvarnos had escaped total destruction, and if nothing else Hiltz knew the speech by heart. But that same heart, still reasonably strong, after all these years, told him that Corson's dying message was no longer appropriate to the moment, and for his people. So Hiltz and a team of scribes had set to work on a new speech. Part manifesto, reminding listeners of what it meant to be Sith, part legal document, restating the hierarchy of high lords, lords, and sabers and reaffirming the practices. Surrounding succession. But the meat of the message, and the thing that excited the aged ruler most, was a section recounting the lineage of the humans of Kesh, all the way back to the Tapani members of House Nidantha. For Hiltz, it represented his crowning achievement, beyond even his grand lordship. Soon after the Hiltz restoration began, he and other researchers had started to place everything they'd recently uncovered in context, from the fragmented orders of Naga Sado to Takara Corson's missive to her son. There had always been puzzling references in the ancient writings from the original Omen survivors, now they all made sense. The humans of the tribe were important in the galactic scheme, and, shockingly, they were a people far older than the Sith movement itself. Through the styluses of Kashiri writers more eloquent than he, what had been a simple recounting of events became poetry calculated to instill the tribe with pride. Blocked from supremacy in the Tapani sector, the members of House Nidantha had struck out to find a new, greater destiny on their own, only to become trapped and enslaved by the Sith of the Stygian Caldera. But the tribe's ancestors would not be kept low, especially not after they learned the empowering philosophies of the Sith and the workings of the dark side of the Force. Yes, the Omen crew's arrival on Kesh had been every bit as accidental as their Tapani forebears' arrival in Sith space, but there were no accidents. The first years of the tribe on Kesh had been, in effect, a do-over, in which the humans became the rulers and slavers, and in which the Red Sith were quickly and rightfully extinguished. If only the Tapani refugees had already known the Force when they arrived in the Stygian Caldera. How different history might have been. No matter, the tribe was making its own history now. Whatever had become of Naga Sado and his kind during the last two thousand years, the people that would eventually leave Kesh would be independent. A new Sith, born of an old people. Hiltz had been tempted to use his true testament to publicly dub the tribe members Nidanthans, but he'd thought better of it. They may have started out as part of an interstellar trading house, but their identity now was in what they'd done since arriving. Years earlier, the lost tribe term had carried the ring of failure. Now the words reminded all of what they had already achieved. In becoming lost, the tribe had found so much more. It's good, Hilt said, parchment crackling in his pale hands. Good enough. He set the pages down atop the only level spot. Too bad you couldn't be here for this, Jay. You always liked my stories. Vana, you look like the wrong end of a new vac. Eh? I don't understand, Ileana Hilt said, billowing in. Wearing a satiny gown laden with gems, the redhead pinched his cheeks and frowned. We bring in the best skin specialists for you. I banished them from the realm, he said, rubbing his jaw. 
They kept wanting to plant trees in my pools. It's an organic poultice, Varna. They're experts. They groom all the best people. Well, now they're grooming icebergs. Shoving his head down, she straightened his collar. Does the irascible ruler routine amuse the Kashuri? Because it doesn't work with me. Nothing works with you, my dear. He grinned up at her through ceramic teeth. It's one of the truths on which I depend. He never could tell whether Ileana loved him or hated him. But after all these years, it didn't really matter. They worked. He doubted many couples on Kesh could say the same. Sure, it had taken the threat of death to wake them to a common interest. He couldn't fight for himself, and as consort, she would be allowed to live only while he stayed alive. But maybe that was what Sith relationships required. Get up, she said, yanking his rickety chair backwards so fast he nearly fell from it. You're needed in the throne room. Again? I'd rather lick the floor. He gestured to the almost finished tract on the desk. I'm needed here. This is where I can be effective. Ileana sighed. More words. Shoving her hands under his arms, she forced him to stand. They're all you're about. You are always a poor Sith. Where's your anger, your envy? I grow angry every time I look in the mirror. And I envy every time I see someone shy of seventy. She straightened his tunic and bit her lip. This will have to do. The High Lord Corsin Bentadu is requesting an audience. Hiltz groaned. I knew I'd live too long. He stared forlornly at the parchment. He'd never get done at this rate. Just send him away. Nothing would make me happier. Ileana said, rolling her eyes. But you put him in charge of the invasion force. Why would I do that? Because I told you to. A Bentadu who's busy is better than a Bentadu wandering around, finding cults to start. She shrugged. But mostly, because I told you to. Bentadu. He said sullenly. The man made his sides hurt. Edelvre. Now there's a smart man. And you sent him on the expedition, Varna, she said, prodding him toward the door. Now, come on. I do everything else around here, but I'm not doing this. Blessings of the dark side to your family, Grand Lord, Corson Bentadu said. Sitting in the captain's chair from Omen, Hiltz mumbled an inaudible response. Did the dark side bless things? Imbecile. As always, it is an honor to visit this place, this holiest of holies in Tav. Bentadu said, gesturing around the throne room with his one remaining hand. Yara Corson had died before he could ever hold court here, and the long, high-ceilinged room had remained closed until Hiltz reopened it. Bentadu rattled on. I stared in wonder outside before the new glass spires. It proves what I've said. The Hilt's restoration only begins on Kesh. But it reaches to the stars, where you will someday restore us all to our rightful place of dominance. Okay. High Lord Bentadu strutted before eight Sith warriors, all dressed as he was in black leather. Well into his fifties, Bentadu looked just as he had in his youth bald with bushy black facial hair. Hilt suspected he'd had a lot of work done by Ileana's specialists. What kind of man dyes his eyebrows? The news we've been waiting years for has arrived at last, Bentadu declared. Squab! Bentadu faced the great doors, where a hunchbacked Kashiri entered bearing a note. Standing just behind the Grand Lord, Ileana rolled her eyes. Well, she whispered in her husband's shriveled ear. Now we know why it took years to get here. Hush, Hiltz replied, trying not to laugh. It had been their private joke five years earlier, suggesting Squab as Bentado's aide. The High Lord had feigned delight at the recommendation, readily accepting the deformed Kashiri into his retinue of perfect human specimens. They'd wondered how far he'd take it, 
and were still wondering. Bentadu never showed up without his stunted assistant in tow. Bentadu took the note and held it aloft. Success, he declared. Our listeners heard the call through the force just hours ago. Adele Vray has found the hidden land Yaru Corson revealed to us. It exists. He crumpled the parchment in his gloved fist. The probe is done. It's time for the strike. Hiltz looked at his wife. Her sources had told her the same thing earlier in the day, but it was nothing to get excited about yet. We should wait until Adele gets back. Grand Lord, most of the airships are ready. My crews are staffed and waiting. You agreed, if we found anything at all, it was worth conquering with full force. Bentadu turned to face his troops. We await your command to strike. You said that. Rubbing her husband's shoulders over the chair back, Ileana smirked. He's not telling you the rest, Grand Lord. My people were listening, too. Only one clear message arrived. But there were other emotions sensed later. Surprise. Shock. Confusion. She stopped rubbing. And then, nothing. They've found a whole new world, consort. There's probably much of them to wonder at, and they're likely confused about what to do next. Adele Vray is no warrior. Respected, yes, as a high lord should be, but still a talented tinkerer. He's waiting for my forces to arrive, to carry out the invasion. Ileana sneered. What if Adele's crazy contraptions went down in the ocean? Adele's not dead. I would have sensed that. Ileana glared down at him. She'd said many times he couldn't sense water if he were in a lake. Bentadu smiled broadly. I share your confidence, Grand Lord. The host is ready now. The first sixty airships are inflated and outfitted for war. He knelt, and behind him his followers did so, too. Little Squab caught the hint a moment too late and nearly hit the floor trying to follow suit. I beg your leave to pursue our destiny. Hiltz blinked. Um, sure. The warriors filed out. Before following, Bentado's Kashiri companion bowed again before the throne, this time, more properly. Hilt smiled gently at the effort. Remaining until last, Bentadu saluted the Grand Lord and stalked off after his crew. Hilt looked up at Ileana and cocked a thinning white eyebrow. We're wasting an airship on him. That man is his own gas bag. He's in such a hurry, Ileana said. She looked perplexed. He should wait for Edel to return. He's taking all his people to drown. And that would bother you? Not at all, Ileana said, making for another exit in a whirl of lace. He handpicked them. Anyone bent to do trusts is worth drowning. 7. Mischance, the sailing ship was named, and it was purely mischance that put the Kashiri sailors on the water that night, Edel mused. He and his crew had set out from the southern shore of the peninsula, Point Defiance, the local map called it, minutes after finding the boat. They delayed only to move Cora and the one named Jogan aboard as prisoners. The woman had objected, the feverish male kept fading in and out. But Adele needed a guide, and thus far her spouse, if that was what he was, had served as leverage. The timing was good. The forces from Garrow's neck arrived just as they were vanishing into the watery night. The troops would find the place empty and ransacked, Ulbrich's body had been dumped down a cistern. Meanwhile, Adele and company made for the ship he'd seen, rowing hard against the cross-current to reach it while the cover of night remained. The Kashiri sailors had indeed been unaware of the earlier battle, surprise was absolute. They fought like wild animals nonetheless. It had taken the Sith until dawn to seize control of mischance, and even then all but one of the defenders had fought to the death. Now, with the sun climbing to its autumnal noontime position in the north, 
the last Miss Chancer had died in screaming agony under the torture of his questioners. Idel watched from the bow as Pepin emerged from the wheelhouse, removing her gloves. What did you learn? Not much, Pepin said. For sea farmers, they were made of pretty strong stuff. Seems to be a local trait. He replied, looking back to the foredeck where Quora and her partner were tied to a mast. The ship was out here trapping crustaceans. Miss Chance is due to sit out here for a week before returning. Idel scanned the coastline. There were no signal stations visible anywhere on land, so there was no way for the Kashiri to call Miss Chance back in, and the only way they could see who was aboard the vessel was aerially, aboard Yavak. We could sit here for a while. Pepin seemed taken aback. We might not have to, sir. The Kashiri have good maps of the currents down here. Getting home might just be a matter of pulling up anchor. Home. Idel looked up at the lone square sail, furled on the yardarms. Pepin could figure out how to steer the vessel, all right. She'd been on his staff for years, soaking up his knowledge of engineering. They could do it, and it made sense to get home as quickly as possible. It would complete the mission as assigned, and bringing back even a lowly harvesting vessel would be an achievement. It was larger than any seagoing ship Keshta had ever produced. Pepin read his thoughts. It would make for a good transport, it could carry back a couple hundred Sith or more, I figure. A lot easier than flying them here. She paused. A lot safer, too. Idel's thoughts went to their explosive arrival, and then recalled the dream from his delirium on the shore. His mood darkened. Would returning mischance be enough of a personal triumph? Not with things as they were back home. Corson Bentadu was already readying the next wave. The Ebon Fleet, twenty times larger than his own expedition. Would Bentadu await his return, or launch early? He knew the answer. And he knew that, were their roles reversed, Bentadu certainly wouldn't sail mildly back home. But what more could he do? He looked again at Quora and Jogan. He knew nothing of the mail, but she was clearly somebody among the Kashiri. The documents she carried said that, but he'd seen it in her demeanor first. She'd been all over this land, this Alancier. She understood how the signal station worked, as well as the various weapons here. And she understood deep in her breast whatever it was that was making these Kashiri fight so hard. Yes, that would be something to know. Idel turned back to Pepin. I have new orders. Listen, and then follow my lead. Cora watched carefully as the lead Sith talked. She couldn't hear, but his thuggish cohorts were around him now, paying attention. Compared with the younger marauders, Idel was relatively slight. How had he gotten to be on the mission, much less in charge? Probably, she concluded, through shows of brutality like the one outside the signal station. Yet twice she had overheard one of them calling him, High Lord, a term of much larger significance from the Chronicles. The first time, she'd thought they were being sarcastic to the smaller human, the Sith had a sneering way of talking to one another. But seeing the deference they were paying him now, she wasn't so sure. A High Lord. Were the Sith so few in number that this was the biggest invading party one of their top officials could muster? She hoped so, but she also worried that what she'd seen over the harbor was just one part of the Sith force. That there had been more airships farther north, threatening the fertile farms of the Western Shield, or worse, passing over them to the populated uplands in the interior. Urar was there. Were her co-workers and family safe? For the first time in hours, she thought of Brew her husband. He knew so little of war, or their preparations for it. What would he have told the children, when the alarm whistle sounded? At least one thing wasn't worrying her anymore, unless the old guard at Garrow's neck remembered her name, no one would know that she had been at Point Defiance. Strange to think that, by spiriting her away, the Sith might have saved her marriage. But she wasn't the only one they'd taken. Tied beside her, Jogan drifted in and out of sleep. His ribs had nearly punctured his lungs back on the isthmus, she realized, he was lucky to be alive. Especially after being manhandled by the Sith carting him around. They'd tied him to the mast sitting up, and she could feel his agony through the force, and through their touching shoulders. 
Every time mischance pulled against its anchor, Jogan seethed with pain. He opened his eyes again. W where am I? He asked. With me, she said, fighting for any words that would bring comfort in this situation. We're done moving now. Not true. The Sith High Lord said, stepping toward her. At least not for you, Cora Thane. You're coming with me. What? Cora strained against her bonds and stopped suddenly, remembering that Jogan was tied to her. Idel clasped his hands in front of him. This first meeting of our peoples has not gone well. You haven't provided your neighbors a proper welcome. That's too bad. Reparations will come later. But in the meantime, I would like to know more about you. About me? All of you. Alancia. He said, waving to the mountaintops just visible on the northern horizon. I want to see whoever is in authority here. And you will take me, Cora. But on my terms, and on my timetable. Taking a scrolled map from Pepin, he walked to the railing and gestured. There's a small cove to the northeast, shadowed by the mountains, and not under surveillance. You and I will row to it. Your military capital is several days' walk from there, according to this. Miss Chance will remain here until I signal from the mountains that I've returned. He said. Quora stared at him. You're crazy. You don't look anything like us. We know you're here now. Our people will spot you in a heartbeat. You'll think of something. Idel said mildly, passing the map to his female companion. You must, if you want your precious Jogan to live. If I haven't returned freely in two weeks, he'll follow the harvesters we threw to the bottom of the ocean. Cora looked at Jogan. He was slumping again, fading. She doubted he'd heard a word. I don't want to leave him. You don't have any choice. Craning her neck, she spotted Telpa. You've got your own Kashiri slave with you. Let him be your pack animal. Why do you need me? Don't be a fool. I need a local guide who knows the area. We brought Kashiri along to spread their religion. A religion centered on us. But you met us with war. I want to see what else you have in store. She studied Jogan for a long moment before looking back at the human. There might be a way I can hide who you are, she said. But I'll only do it on one condition. You're not in a position to negotiate. On the condition that you untie Jogan from that mast. There are bunks in the cabin. Let him lie down. You keep knocking him around, you're going to kill him. Idel nodded. I can be reasonable. Move him. Immediately his companion stepped forward to untie the Kashiri couple from the mast. Feeling the bonds loosened, Jogan looked back at her with bleary eyes. Gratification crossed his face, and then concern. Cora, I'm not sure what's going on, but whatever it is, you don't have to do this for me. I'm not worth it. I'll be the judge of that, she said. She studied the humans again. Not Kashiri, but maybe not monsters, either just as capable of doubt, and of making bad decisions. And I think I may have just the thing that'll scare these Sith back to where they came from. She looked to the north. I have a Lancier. 8. Keshta was the Sith domain. But a Lancier, Adel realized, was the true empire. In his homeland, it was possible to travel in secrecy in some places by avoiding the main roads. Here, it wasn't. The foliage, such trees, here, had been cut back far from the raised stone pathways, and trenches separated the stands from travelers. Staffed way stations looked up and down long stretches, observing traffic in either direction. 
Adele and Cora had slipped unseen onto a remote mountain highway in the dark of night, but he doubted they'd be able to cross more country that way. Alancier was aware. Shrill whistles continued to sound over the hills, seeming to come from all directions. He still hadn't gotten used to them. The screeches came from every populated area, louder than anything he'd ever heard. Quora had explained them as warning sirens, generated by passing steam through colossal glass pipes. Every village seemed to have one. It was the fourth morning since the Sith flotilla's arrival, and the alarms were still sounding. Aware. Idel saw another way station up ahead and drew the hood of the seafarer's slicker over more of his face. His appearance continued to worry him. Jogan's Alancier uniform had been too large for him, and Idel had considered changing into the sailor's clothes. But Cora had given him the coat instead, along with a pair of shaded goggles she'd found aboard ship to hide his eyes. That, and a little work on his face, would be all that was necessary to conceal his identity, she'd said. Idel couldn't imagine how that could be. And yet, it had worked so far. They had encountered no one in the first day and night of travel, crossing the wooded mountains northward from Miori Cove. But since starting on the road the second day, they'd seen lots of Kashiri, mostly soldiers, headed west. Everyone had stopped them, and every exchange had gone the same way. Now, at the crossroads, it was playing out again. What do you have here? The armed sentry asked, eyeing Adele. One of the performers for Kareba, Quora replied, flashing her identification. Papers. Tonight? Yeah. Guess they wouldn't want to break tradition. Especially not now. The sentry stepped back to his guardhouse and nodded to Adele. He's a good one, he is. Move along. Pocketing the documents, Quora turned up the road to the north. Come on, she growled back at Adele. The High Lord stomped after her. What was he talking about? Why do they keep letting me pass? You'll see. He grabbed her vest and yanked her to face him. You're in no position to be cute with me, Kashiri. And you're not in a place where you can push me around, she said. Behind, the way station guard looked toward them. There were others inside, and a staffed signal tower was within sight, just off the road. I yell, Sith, and you're dead, she said coolly. And probably dissected. Behind the goggles, Adele's golden eyes widened. Grudgingly, he released her and continued to follow her up the road. There was more to the woman than he had thought. He grew more certain of that an hour later, after a long stretch of silence. She wasn't just our over being his unwilling guide, he realized. When prodded, she responded. I'm worried about my family. She looked back at him curtly. You do know what those are, right? Your family? Idel said. You have children? It depends. You don't eat them, do you? Idel's eyes narrowed. Your children weren't at the signal station. Sent away? Quora simply glared at him. Pieces fell into place for Adele. Ah, I see. You do have a husband. But that strapping purple specimen wasn't him. Ha ha ha. It seems that I'm not the only thing you have to hide. She turned her face away and kept walking. I don't think I have to be judged by a Sith. Oh, I'm not judging you, Adele said, a twinkle in his golden eye. Unless, Unless it's, it's to, to say, say that, that you have, have more in common more with the Sith, than you, with think. The Sith than you think. The canal had two lanes for traffic, with a white towpath in the center. Big, Adele said. Almost a river. It was, once. We've made upgrades. Adele watched as packet boats and barges sped up and down the canals, yoked to teams of the beasts Cora called Muntoks. How can the boats go so fast? He'd studied the idea of developing a similar canal system for cargo back home, to coincide with the repairs to the elevated aqueducts. He'd finally given up. Fast traffic caused wakes that damaged the lining of the walls. Look closer. Kneeling, Adele felt the smooth bank of the canal. Concrete. The Kashiri back home knew the compound, cement, aggregate, 
and water were in plentiful supply, but they seldom used it, preferring to work with slabs of polished rock. They kept it out of sight when they used it at all. But the Alansir Kashiri looked to have lined their entire river system with it. This must have taken centuries. We had time. Adele crossed the bridge with her, tolerating first yet another puzzling conversation with a sentry. The High Lord still had no idea what they were talking about, but he sensed no deception on Quora's part. Adele had instructed her to take him to the seat of government, and she seemed to be complying. The bulk of the continent was to the northeast, and they'd been zigzagging in that direction for hours. She was also becoming freer with details about her world, perhaps thinking the sights were making an impression on him. He'd been careful not to give her reason to think that, after all, his people had come from the stars. And though years of studying Omen had brought him no closer to being able to replicate a single thing inside that ancient ship, nothing about the water wheels, brick fortresses, or paved rivers eluded his understanding. The fact that they existed here, however, did. It was hard to believe the people who had created them were of the same species as the Kashiri he knew. What had made them like this? We're here, Quora said. Kareba. As far as we go today. Kareba was the biggest town he'd yet seen, drab and uninviting. Concrete wasn't just for canals, the Alansiari lived in uninspired blocks of it. As the sun disappeared over a gray horizon, a depressing darkness flooded the streets. And, always, there was that blasted whistle sounding, here, louder than ever. I don't want to overnight in a populated area, he said, raising his voice as they approached the town square. We can't go farther. The roads will be closed. They weren't closed last night. What are you talking about? Idel trailed off in astonishment. He looked to the pipes on a rooftop nearby. The whistles had stopped. Concerned, he tried to pull Quora closer, only to be jostled by Kashiri, young and old, stepping out into the streets. Most were in uniform, like those he had met along the way, but not all. Some, he saw, were dressed relatively festively, in bright colors. More Kashiri entered the avenue, chattering and laughing. <laughs> For a second, he thought he saw a human. Here's one. Quora yelled, yanking back Adele's hood. The High Lord stood, stunned, as Kashiri all around him gawked. His hand jabbed inside the slicker, where his lightsaber was clipped to his tunic. But just as he grabbed the weapon, the crowd laughed. <laughs> they laughed. Circling around, the locals hooted and hooped, pointing at the newcomer's exposed face, paler and pinker than any Kashiri's. Beneath the goggles, Quora had applied a little makeshift face paint to Adele in angry black streaks, giving him a menacing appearance. Now she ripped at the back of the jacket, pulling it down and exposing his outfit, and the unlit weapon. He's great, called one bystander. Look at his color, even as a lightsaber. Cheers of delight rose from the crowd, cheers that soon turned to jeers, at his expense. And not just him now. Befuddled, Adele looked to see other Kashiri dancing onto the streets, dressed in black with their faces painted in a variety of unpurple hues. The crowd went wild. The Sith! The Sith! The masqueraders fled toward the dusky plaza, where a great stage had been set up. Pushed along with the crowd, Adele had no choice but to follow, and was blinded when light blazed down from above. On mighty tripods, colossal globes burned brightly some luminescent substance within mirrored and amplified a dozen times. At once, all of Kareba could be seen. And all of it, it seemed, was heading here. The lights, Adele thought, looking up. Corsin saw a continent in lights. He looked to either side, suddenly realizing that he'd been separated from Quora. No, there she was, working her way back to him, and smiling smugly. Ahead, revelers were climbing the dais, preparing some kind of production. So this is why they called me a performer. He glared at her. I'm not going up there. You don't have to, she said, gesturing. There were Sith in the audience, too, snarling at revelers and receiving booze from excited uniformed children. 
Just be your nasty self. Adele watched as Kashiri erected props on the stage. Rocks. Painted waves. A large sailing ship. Two Kashiri were joined in a Yivak costume. You thought you were under siege. You're stopping for a play. Here and in every city in Alancia. It's observance day. They weren't going to cancel because of your invasion. She seemed to swell with pride as she spoke. Especially not because of that. I don't think much of it, he said. The Kashiri back home put on lavish pantomimes, wearing rich regalia and performing in marbled halls. Patrons were rarely in short supply, as theater was always useful propaganda to some Sith or another. The troops in the capital city had kept up their standards even as civilization around them had declined, breaking production only during the riots a quarter century earlier. They'd been an important part of restoring civil order, too, spreading the word of what Hiltz had discovered at the Mountain Temple. But this outdoor theater in the round seemed amateurish, the costumes not at all ready for Tov. He was about to say as much when, on stage, the prop ship suddenly tossed in a pretend storm. The false rock rose to bar its path, and a Kashiri woman appeared from behind it. The audience applauded her arrival. Clad in leather armor, she held aloft a shining glass staff with a glowing globe on top, a miniature version of the lights illuminating the plaza. The rollicking ship stopped suddenly and dropped flat to the stage, revealing actors dressed like the sailors Adele had seen. Seeing her staff, they cowered. A hush fell over the crowd. I am Adari Val, and I am the Rock of Kesh. Adari? Adele couldn't help but blurt the name, realizing as he did so that eyes were turning toward him. He froze. Cora looked urgently toward him. Adele slunk, and attention turned back to the stage. He asked himself if he'd heard properly. On stage, he got his answer. I am Adari, the Rock and the Herald. Savior and lost daughter. Ally to the bright Tuash, legendary winged bearer of mercy, the Adari actress said. Cast off from far away, I rose from the ocean to bring you tidings of fear and wonder. I am the rock that rose from the sea, and I will tell you of the flood to come. Idel gawked. Adari Val. Yara Corson's confidant, or plaything, depending on which account you believed. The woman who had attempted a Kashiri insurrection, and fled to a watery death. He looked around. The Kashiri here seemed to have heard the speech before. Some were mouthing it as the actress spoke. There are enemies beyond your ken, people of Alancier. You cannot see them, for they are beyond the sail of your farthest ship. You cannot hear them, though they may speak their evil and dangerous whispers to be heard on the air. Adele grumbled in Cora's ear. This is formal talk. She should state her meaning plainly. It's a ceremony, she whispered. We do it every ten years. Ten years was the length of Adari's secret resistance against the tribe, Cora said, and on stage, the speaker was telling of that tribe and its evil. The Sith players emerged on stage, from behind the same rock. The audience hissed and moaned. Adari raised her staff to the sky. Yes, the Sith are the destructors foretold, but fear not. For I have seen your Lancier, and it is superior to Keshta, in all of nature's gifts. She walked the perimeter of the stage, pointing outward. Superior in the produce of your forests, fine, strong woods for sailing vessels. The jungles of Keshta yield little that will bear weight. Superior in the creatures of the field, the mighty Shumsher, the swift Muntok. Beyond the Yuvak, Keshta has no creatures that will bear the yoke. We ate them all! A Sith jester on stage interjected, earning peals of laughter. <laughs> Throwing his arms before him to simulate a huge belly, he waddled around to derogatory hoots and calls. Fools, fools. Adari smiled. Yes, that too, Alancier is supreme in the intelligence of its people. With flame broth and mirror you created the fire globes, to keep your ways and homes lit. Your canals provide transport. 
industry reaches all in a lancier. Adele looked across the listeners as the recitation of successes continued. Until this moment, he'd steeled himself against the sights of a lancier. It had long been suspected the place was more advanced. But now, surrounded by the enemy, he felt great unease. He'd grown up in a tribe that had lost its way. Nothing had been certain. It was what had drawn him to architecture and engineering as a teenager. Those had rules, unchanging and unquestioned. Yes, the restoration had repaired much of the damage, giving the Sith something to believe in again, but the Alansir Kashiri had never stopped believing, since Adarival visited them 2,000 years before. Scanning the faces ahead of him, Idel saw certainty. Why wasn't I born here? I will teach you the language of the evil ones. You will speak it as your native tongue, so as to know them when they arrive. And I give you another gift, the speaker said, lowering the glowing staff in the direction of the Kashiri sailors. The Sith Tap is a power known as the Force. It is a power some of you already have, within yourselves. As the fire globe touched the first sailor, he ripped off his outer costume to reveal a satiny white outfit, glistening with gold. I do not have the power. But you may, and now, you know to look for it. You are the protectors of Kesh. She smiled graciously and looked at the audience. And you are, as well. You have fought the first battle, she said, adding something new to the obvious delight of the listeners. You won. And you will win again. I declare this day a day of observance. You will always be observant. And one day, you will triumph forever. The audience roared in self-congratulation. Adele watched in stunned silence as Cora cheered loudly and clapped. An elderly male stepped onto the stage. Identifying himself as the mayor of Kareba, he seconded the call for vigilance. We have seen all this drama before, but this is a special time of all times. The enemy has come. Tonight, our forces are scouring the peninsulas for any trace of the attackers. They will come again to be certain. The war cabinet has deployed anti-air forces to the west. Whether they come again in the same numbers or more, they will die. Die like Sith should. The crowd erupted in shots, but more organized than before. Fists pumped into the air in unison. Die like Sith! Die like Sith! It was too much. Adele grabbed Cora's arm and pushed his way out of the crowd. Self-conscious, he put on the coat and hood again. He'd wanted to leap on stage and kill the preening yammerers. He could have. Others would have. Why hadn't he? He struggled to control his anger. It wasn't the time, and one little depot town wasn't the place. If what he'd just seen was indeed happening everywhere, then Bentado's invasion force was in peril. And maybe, even, the tribe itself? We can go tomorrow as soon as the roads open. Adele said to Quora in the shadows. I want to see this war cabinet and learn exactly what that Kashiri traitor told you about all of us. 9. Cora awoke to rain pelting her face. Her eyes opened to see Kesha's son peeking through a lush green canopy, high above. Warm raindrops struck her cheeks. Wet season in the jungle, called a deep female voice from behind. Even when it's done raining, it stays in the trees. You shouldn't lie around outside like that, not without a hat. Cora dried her eyes and blinked. Alancier hadn't had jungles in centuries. Obviously, it wasn't where she'd gone to sleep. But where was she? She sat up in the mud. Behind her, a human woman in a straw hat worked the soil, transferring flowers from clay pots. She was tanner and younger than Adele, and wore short auburn hair. Got to replant the Delsars while the soil's still wet, she said, not looking up from her work. Cora, right. You really ought to think about that hat. It pays to keep your hair short here, too. The arachnoids are hideous here. 
Cora tensed on hearing her name. The Sith took me here. You're one of them. The human chuckled. I never used to take back talk from Kashiri. You're lucky. I've mellowed since we moved here. Aside in a clearing in the trees, Quora saw another human working a small plot with a hoe. In the dappled light she almost thought she was looking at Jogan, muscular, serene. But still alien. You're both Sith, she said. We're nothing, the female replied, rising from the flower bed to face the Kashiri. We're nothing when we are, or when you are. I'm Auriel, call me Ori. And his Jelf. At the words, the sun's rays mirrored through the mist. The world went wavy for a moment. This isn't real, Quora said. I'm having a force vision. Or a dream. Never thought there was much difference, Ori said. You live in the jungle? I do. Or did. Time passes differently in jungles and dreams. Quora looked down to see a human toddler tromping through puddles. Before he could reach her garden, Ori hoisted the child onto her hip. Quora heard other young voices from behind a hut. You have children. Three. Like you. Right. It had to be a dream, Quora knew. None of the Sith knew details of her family. She watched as Ori delivered the child to his older siblings, muddied themselves, but happy. An entire life lay here in the jungle clearing. Small, but seemingly full. I had responsibilities like you, once. I gave them up for love. Love? A Sith? Quora caught herself. Sorry, you said you weren't. I said I wasn't Sith now. But I guess I wasn't a very good Sith before, either. Is there a good Sith? Some are easier to live around than others, but if so, they're probably not very good at being Sith, either. Ori laughed. And no, love isn't the only reason I came here. I had responsibility, and a position, like you. I saw where it was leading. I didn't like it. Cora looked at the meager accommodations. This is what you chose instead. This is what hiding looks like, Ori replied. She looked over at the children playing, and took a deep breath. The problem is, the world was already running out of places to hide in my time. I don't know that there's much future in it. Cora's shoulders slumped as she listened. Between the children and the sounds of the jungle, it was a noisy place, but she sensed peacefulness here, something she'd longed for often in Arar. I wanted to live apart, she said, almost to herself. I'm so tired. I looked around and all I could see were things I'd already done. Even my children, I already knew what their lives were going to look like, before they'd lived them. Cora paused. I guess that's why I created something different for myself. To give me a dream to follow. I'm sure it sounds bad. Oh, you can follow a dream, Ori said gazing back at her husband. The farmer looked up briefly and smiled back at the two of them before returning to his work. You can follow a dream, and you can build your whole world around one. She looked back at the Kashiri. You can live in a dream for a long time. But eventually... Eventually, the world will find you, Cora whispered. She opened her eyes. They'd slept in a dry culvert, just off the side of the Kareba Canal Station. There was no use convincing Adele to stay with her in one of the barracks her official status entitled her to. Since the observance day play, he'd been wound up like a hand ballista ready to go off. She couldn't tell whether that was a good thing or not, she'd seen what he was capable of. But it meant something that he was so tense now. She had been right, a lancier had been her greatest weapon against him. The farther North Cora led the Sith, the more confident she grew. It was increasingly clear that his party was the only one that had landed, and as they passed through more industrial centers, she could see him imagining the weapons being constructed there. That didn't stop him from continuing to feign indifference, she saw. Another ugly village, he said as they left Minrath. You don't fool me, Sith. I can sense it, Quora said. You're impressed.
Idel looked directly at her. I'll admit your kashiri here are better suited for crafting practical implements than ours are. Your kashiri? Of course. Who else owns them? Quora let out an exasperated sigh. Keshta is a soft and beautiful continent. Perhaps that's what turned its natives to art. Yes, they made aqueducts, but they made them beautiful. He gestured to a canal crossing up ahead. If they thought about function, as your people do, our aqueducts would have lasted longer. They're gone. No, we repaired them. But if your people had designed them, we never would have had the problem. He looked away, as if weighing his next words. I think that Omen landed in the wrong place. Cora shook her head. You didn't listen to anything back in Kareba, did you? You are the reason a Lancier looks the way it does. You Sith, and the threat of you. For two thousand years, we've been preparing for your coming. She looked back onto the gray cityscape and lamented. You don't understand us at all. You made us like this. Idel smirked. And if you think we would regret it, then you don't understand us. By noon, they reached the prettier country of the Western Shield. Things were more spread out on this bulge of the shank, with state farms straddling the waterways, and Montauk-driven hay carts rumbling along the roads. Land that had once climbed gently eastward to the plateau that formed the bulk of the continent had long since been reshaped into orderly terraces. But the harvest was near, and the sight of so many greens and golds made even the towering fortresses amid the fields easy to overlook. Quora's eyes traced a line of flashing signal stations delivering news from the coast to the military capital at Seuss Mintry, perched at the plateau's western edge. The rise was just visible in the clouds to the east, a lofty natural battlement, protecting the guts of a lancier. She felt badly for the signalers and thought criers here. Jogan's life may not have been full of excitement, she thought, but at least he had more to look out upon than fields of grain. Since her dream, thoughts of Jogan had troubled her. His tower was no jungle refuge, she knew, and she'd begun to question their entire relationship. He was the isolated one, with nothing to do most days, but she'd always been the one to write to him. She was no doubt the busier of the two, and yet every time their conversations ended owing to some assignment of hers, it had always been Cora who struck up the next talk. She had imagined that since she had so much to do, he was simply deferring to her schedule. But maybe he simply didn't care as much. What did he care about? And what good would a powerful woman be in the life of an inveterate bachelor watchtower guard, anyway? She'd begun to wonder. The sentinels in your thoughts again, Idel said. You have trouble hiding it. He sniffed at the air. I never married, of course. There's a shock, she said. Who could live with a Sith? I'm amazed there are any humans left on Kesh. Idel laughed, a dark hearty sound that startled her. Ha <laughs> ha, I wonder about that too. I tend to prefer building things to the company of others. Maybe that's how he got to be High Lord, she thought. He's a shut-in. Maybe nobody who leaves the house ever reaches fifty over there. Social graces aside, she couldn't help but be impressed by his drive, even if it was toward a bad end. She'd wondered after the play why he hadn't simply gone back to Miss Chance and departed with what he'd learned. Evidently, he didn't feel that would be enough to keep him from losing face after being shot down. It was easy to imagine that he had rivals, the Chronicles described seven High Lords. Was his position at risk if he only brought back intelligence? I have to... do... something. He'd said again and again. But what could he do? Possibly quite a bit. The force flowed around Adele and his human companions in a way it didn't for anyone she'd ever known in Alanciar. The Alanciari had trainers in the use of the force as they did for everything else, but at root was an understanding that was shallow at best just what Adarival had been able to describe from observing the talents of the Sith. 
But Adele came from a long tradition of force use. What secret powers did he know? Several, she decided. That they'd gotten this far wasn't due to her ability to bluff. Adele was doing something, surreptitiously deadening the reason of those who cast their eyes toward him. She saw him as he was. Others, if not literally seeing Adele as he wanted to appear, seemed unable to focus much attention on him without becoming distracted by something else. That would be handy to learn, she thought. But whatever he was doing wouldn't be enough to hide his appearance after today. Observance day was over, and a traveling actor still in Sith costume wouldn't do. She pointed up ahead. As soon as we reach the crossing, we'll find a cargo boat to ride in up the canal. Enjoy the air while you can, you're going to be riding with the crates. How long will that take? It's the straightest line to Seuss Mintry. Should just be a day or two, she said. A day. You're lucky it's this close. The war cabinet used to meet far in the interior, before Val Hall was built. They'd call me in for meetings and it would take forever to get there. It's just a couple days ride from Arar now. But don't worry. There'll be plenty of time to get back to Miss Chance, and for you to live up to your side of the deal. He looked at one of the packet boats, slipping quickly down the channel without the aid of a Muntok team. They don't look comfortable inside. Surely you can do better. Quora rolled her eyes. We're not going to find you a luxury cabin. If you wanted to travel your own way, you should have flown your airships higher and not gotten shot. Screet. The sound was back and all around, the alarm whistles, coming from the towers in the fields running up the hillside. Quora pointed to the signal stations, fire globes blinking non-stop. The color vocabulary was more limited in the daytime, but she could see from the nearest tower the same message that Jogan had first sent the continent. The Sith are back. Grabbing her forearm with one hand, Adele ripped his goggles off with the other. Urgently, he scanned the low horizon to the northwest. They're out there, he said. I know, she replied. The unease she'd experienced in the station belfry was back tenfold. And now the thought criers were screaming warnings, too. Adele's arrival nights earlier had been a sprinkling. Now a storm was coming. And, astonishingly to her, the High Lord seemed even less happy about it than she was. Too soon! Too soon! He waved his arms to the skies. Too soon! Ten. They appeared as flecks of tar on the pastel sky, blisters of evil a thousand meters over the ground. An ominous chevron of airships, either end stretching beyond the horizon, and another, trailing group, higher still. The ships were larger than Adele's nimble scout vessels, with twice the number of captive Yuvak driving them ahead. Painted designs turned the balloons into beasts, scowling at the farmlands. And the monsters had teeth beneath, each of the mighty Vasa wood frame gondolas came to a spear's point in front. Bentado's Ebon Fleet they came too soon! Adele repeated. The bulk of the force had been nearly ready when he'd cast off on his voyage, but he'd expected them to wait for his return. His own aerial transit had taken three days. To be here now, Adele realized that Bentadu must have left almost immediately after getting Tamor's message of success. Impulsive fool! Why would Grand Lord Hiltz allow it? Adele already knew his answer. The consort, Ileana, would be happy to see Bentadu go. But politics didn't matter now, not when the ships had already crossed the coast and were descending. They'd simply flown over the shoreline ballista batteries. Desperately, Adele looked for something to climb. Were the fortresses across the fields the only defense remaining? He got his answer when one of the blimps blossomed brightly, and then another. He couldn't make out what was shooting at the airships but the fireballs were familiar enough. Thunder rolled across the farmland toward them, and a fog developed all along the western skyline. Blast! How many are there? Quora asked. He raised an eyebrow. You're the enemy! 
I'm not going to tell you. It's not about the war, she said, clutching at his slicker. It's about my family. Urar is just a few days inland. Those things could be there in hours. Before he could respond, a Muntok-driven hay cart hurtled past them. It stopped just short of the canal bridge, where it discharged several Kashiri soldiers. While one detached the cart from the team, two others ripped the hay covering clear. They folded down the wooden walls of the vehicle, revealing a large-sized version of the weapon Quora had wielded against him earlier. Idel stood frozen. He'd thought it was only fog, out west. Looking more closely, he saw it was raining upward, flaming javelins and shards of glass rocketed skyward from similar camouflaged mobile units, hidden throughout the fields. Nearby, the Muntok squawked in surprise as the ballista team fired its weapon with a painful snap. Hurry! Cora yelled, dashing toward the canal station house. The signal tower atop it was ablaze with light and color, communicating the reports of spotters up and down the line. Willing his legs to move from the spot, Idel followed. There were more explosions, with flashes beyond the northern and southern horizons. Curse him! Idel spat on the ground. Too soon! What do you mean? I mean Bintadu. Another High Lord. He wasn't supposed to launch until I returned. Then he'd have known about your fire weapons and everything else. He cursed himself, too. He'd worried that Bentadu would try some sort of assault in the coming weeks, would try this. It was why Adele had stayed, hoping to learn enough to forestall another defeat. But Bentadu had moved immediately, and worse, he had sent most of the ready airships, a disaster beyond reckoning. From behind the canal house, he spied a trio of mighty airships still a couple of kilometers off. Both were losing altitude rapidly, their envelopes punctured. One erupted in flame, another lost all its lift at once and pitched over, sending its inhabitants screaming to the fields below. The fortress across the fields to the northwest opened up, catapulting a shining cloud into the withering remains of the third airship. Diamonds again. The wreckage slammed into the field, where the launchers pummeled it mercilessly. Idel gawked. A calamity of historic proportions was underway, and if not its engineer, he was its witness. At least nothing had struck too close. Look out! Ballista fire from the cart whipped past, nearly striking the signal station. A second later something did hit it. An airship careened past, clipping the tower. Wrenched loose, its gondola plummeted toward the canal. Freed of its weight, the shredded balloon tumbled and bounced across the fields to the east. Without warning, Quora left his side, bolting northward across the canal bridge. Yelling her name, Adele followed, into a stampede. Severed from their canal boat yokes, Muntox charged along the raised towpath, knocking the High Lord heels overhead into the channel. Adele punched through the brackish water and yelled again. Quora! He clambered over the slick walls and ran up the steps to a canal-side cargo platform. The clear sky was gone now, replaced by ebon smoke. Everywhere across the terraced farmlands sweeping out to the ocean, the remains of airships blazed in heaps on the ground, with still more angry pillars rising from beyond the horizon. And there were figures on the ground near some of the downed vessels. Some unmoving, others running, gleaming lightsabers in hand. On the attack or under attack? He couldn't see, but he could feel the same emotion from both sides through the force. Pure pandemonium. The route was on. Die, Sith. Idel's neck jerked back at the familiar voice, but the threat wasn't to him. Meters away from the concrete berm on the northern bank, a black-suited Sith warrior battled an unseen enemy. Not recognizing the male human, Idel leapt from the platform. Lighting behind the warrior, Idel saw the man's foe, Quora. Standing over the body of a fallen Kashiri, Quora fired round after round from the soldiers repeating hand ballista at the Sith invader. The warrior parried the projectiles easily with his lightsaber. Tyro! Idel yelled, pulling off his hood. Over here! 
Korra stopped firing. She looked at him, startled, but the Sith warrior was more surprised. Hi, Lord Vry! That's right! Adele said, speaking loudly to be heard over the surrounding din. He stepped toward the pair. What are you doing here? You were all supposed to await my return when the rest of the fleet was finished. High Lord Bintadu ordered. Before he could finish, the young warrior spied Korra raising her weapon and lunged, bisecting the wooden device. He spun for another stroke, and Adele and Korra both lashed out through the force, hurling the astonished warrior and his lightsaber separately into the nearby field. Adele turned toward her, holding the remains of the split weapon. What are you doing shooting at him? My job, she yelled, kneeling to cradle the fallen Kashiri whose weapon she'd taken. The lavender-skinned warrior was no more than a youngling, Adele saw. I made a deal with you, Sith Lord. No one else. Adele took a step toward her, only to be rocked from his feet by another explosion, much closer. Looking up, he saw a massive airship, the largest of all the Ebon fleet, soaring past. Tattooed with Corson Bentado's sneering emblem, the flagship Yaru careened toward the eastern highlands, its gondola smoking from javelins impaled in its underside. He blinked. Yes, that was the Yaru, all right, vanishing over the eastern horizon. Seconds later, a flash of light and a clap of thunder announced its arrival, or not, atop the plateau. Adele grabbed at Cora's arm. Quick! Let's follow! She jerked away from him. I'm not going. They went east, which is where we were going anyway. The plan has changed, she said, standing. Her face twisted in hurt as she looked at the chaos across the fields. The war's on. I've got to see that my people are safe. That my children are safe. She ran through the smoke toward the bridge, heading back the way they'd come. Adele pulled the hood back over his head and gave chase. I saw your district on the map on the boat. It's southeast of the capital. Two days from it, you said. And it must be at least three days from here. It's out of our way. I don't care, she said. I've got to get home. What about your precious Jogan? Hearing the name, she stopped beneath the signal station and looked up. I don't know what to do about that, she said, her voice cracking as she saw the lights. I can't do everything. But I've got to do this. Idel swallowed. All across the terraced fields, Sith were being blown to bits or riddled with glass from Kashiri gunners. A Lancier hadn't been a good place to be alone and human before. It certainly wouldn't be now. He pulled the hood more tightly around his head and approached her. We've got to get out of here regardless, he said. He clapped his hand on her shoulder. Fine, we do it your way, but then we do it my way. Eleven. The second round of alarms hadn't stopped in three and a half days. They seemed to scream louder than ever. Cora had gotten used to the headache. Half the population's boiling water for the whistles, she thought, and the other half's making ear shells for the deaf. But these were her whistles, Barar's whistles. Standing at midnight in the darkened streets of the industrial town, she felt pride that they'd worked exactly as intended. There had been drills for years, but there had always been some question as to whether the great glass pipes would last through an actual invasion. That question had been answered. All of Alancier seemed to have held up well, from what she'd seen. She and Adele had escaped the conflict by doubling back, but the battle's outcome was readily apparent. The crescent of Sith airships had been wide indeed, sixty vessels striking across a wide swath of territory. All but the two northernmost of the Six Claws had been bypassed, leaving the fighting limited to the Western Shield, a name that had proven more than topographic. The fortresses and balustiers amid the farmlands had destroyed most of the Sith invaders in midair. Others had been driven to ground, where they confronted overwhelming numbers. 
The thought criers reported various Sith still on the loose, and signal towers continued flashing madly. Whether the fugitive Sith were real or phantoms, however, wasn't her problem. She had to get home. She'd flashed her credentials to commandeer a Muntak cart and team. No one was going to interfere with a wardmaster racing to her home district. Adele had ridden in the back, out of sight. After three days and nights ride, she'd arrived just after sunset. Touring Arara that evening made her feel much better. She'd found her children, asleep, in the community's protective shelter, the first place she'd looked, and exactly where they were supposed to be. Her staff had done a marvelous job rounding everyone up, the family had, in fact, been there since Adele's force struck more than a week earlier. The deputy wardmaster had seemed almost disappointed to see her. Her absence had been his time to shine. She couldn't worry about that now. Nor did she need to see Brew, with their children safe and so much glass ammunition being used, he'd probably been ordered back to the factory for a late shift. Stepping out of her office, she looked up at the flashing lights of the signal station and took a deep breath. The cart with Adele inside sat nearby in the darkness. She found him sitting in the back, eating the food she'd snuck out. Your family is safe. Are you satisfied? Yes, she said. Liar. He tossed a bone outside. Let's go. This detour may have been good for you, but it was costly to me. To Sue's Mintry. She climbed onto the driver's seat and took the reins. Adele slipped back into the darkness of the wagon, his back to hers, his face out of sight in the shadows. Rumbling across the stone path, she looked off into the darkness. While aerial attacks were a danger, the blackout, for all but the signal stations, would continue. Finally, she spoke. What did you mean when you said I had more in common with the Sith than I thought? After contemplation, Adele spoke. I mean, you're moved by a desire to improve yourself, and that you despair of weakness in others. I wasn't joking. You're never satisfied. I expect that it has made you a good wardmaster. Wardmaster. A good organizer of others. You see what needs to be done, and you expect it done. You see a lack of ambition as a lack of respect, not just for self, but for others. And you. She didn't respond. This husband of yours, I can almost see his face when you think of him. He is nothing. He never was and never wanted to be more than he is. He's slowing you down. I take it that drove you to that sentinel, that Jogan. But while he may have marginally more to offer than your husband, he's just along for the ride, too. The High Lord took a sip from a bottle. I studied him, you know, while he was my prisoner. He may have a uniform, but he's a watcher, not an actor. You could have him, yes, but you'd soon tire of him. Cora stared into the blackness. There's more to him than that. Maybe, but there's so much more to you. You'd outgrow him, and he'd weigh you down like the Uvac on my airships, and you'd have to cut him loose. Yeah, I saw what you did with yours, she said remembering the massive corpse that had fallen from the sky onto Jogan. Forget it. I'm not going to make a choice like that. That's the good news, Adele said. Because, as with airships, the larger you become, the more you can carry. Power isn't just having choices. Power is being able to decide whether you must choose at all. You can have your husband and your little family and your lover in the tower. And you can extend your authority and have your word obeyed. Cora blinked. What, in service to you? Yes, but also in service to yourself. You could be Sith, Cora. 
It's just a matter of belief. You'll never truly be Sith as long as you wear the chains of anyone else. But casting off these lesser ties is the first step. I'd be careful if I were you, she said. You Sith and your airships have a way of blowing up. Uh, Yami, he stretched out in the back of the cart. Quora looked back to Arar and thought about the other thing she'd just done. The thing she hadn't told him about. She'd sent the message as a general question, perfectly understandable given the recent attack. What should she do if a Sith Lord fell into her hands? The response signal from Seuss Mintry came almost immediately, bring him to us. We know what to do. It couldn't have been any clearer, or more authoritative. The War Cabinet's official identifier code was attached. She imagined the imprimatur going out to all the Ward Masters, now. She wondered what it meant. Surely, they'd want to round up the Sith survivors. But bringing them to the capital? Maybe the secret appendices to the oft-republished chronicles told of some way to safely restrain the Sith indefinitely. Maybe they were wanted for execution and dissection. She looked back at Adele, sleeping. She had just enough time to get him to Val Hall for whatever he wanted to do and return with him to Miori Cove to save Jogan. But even if she took him into a trap, she could still rescue Jogan, and she might have the full force of the Alancier military behind her in the attempt. She could save Jogan, and be a hero, too, having done her job and more. You're right, Sith Lord. I can have everything. 12. Seuss Mintry had started centuries before as just another military outpost at the edge of the plateau, overlooking the lower country of the Western Shield as it spread out to the ocean. Its location between the shoreline battlements and the industrial heartland, however, had placed it at the nerve center of Alanciari signal communications, exactly where the war cabinet wanted to be. Until ten years ago, the leaders of the various military, industrial, and educational directorates had met separately. Val Hall and Seuss Mintry consolidated operations into a dull brick one-story residence, inconspicuous, were it not for the colossal white silo rising next to it in the large, walled courtyard. Unlike Jogan's tower at Point Defiance, the Val Hall tower had multiple levels of signaling lights, pointing in all directions. The occupants of Val Hall could communicate with anyone, from the shipbuilders in the far-flung northeast to the guards at its own gate, just a dusty path away. A brown-clad Kashiri guard looked to the signal tower, and then back at Quora. He spoke loudly to be heard over the alarm whistles. They're telling me to let you in, Ward Master. He rapped at the wagon with his sidearm. Both of you. He said with nervous disdain. The gate opened, and Quora's Muntok team trundled inside. The doors hadn't been closed but an instant when Adele peeked out from underneath the tarp in the back. Both of us? What does that mean? I, I don't know, she stammered, climbing from the seat. He had his lightsaber in hand. The long drive from Morar had left her bone tired and him increasingly agitated. She'd hoped it would dull his edge in case a trap awaited. She'd half expected to be greeted by squads of sharpshooters, awaiting her delivery. But the only things in the courtyard were her and her cart. A bad smell was in the air. Above, signal lights on the tower blinked quietly. And the door to Val Hall was wide open. I don't like this, she said, not meaning to be heard. That makes two of us, Adele said, slipping over the wagon's side and thudding to the ground. Grabbing her shoulder, he turned her to face him. They weren't just expecting you, were they? They were expecting me, too. Looking every direction but at him, Quora struggled for words. You never told me what you wanted to do here. See the country, visit the capital, meet the war cabinet. She shrugged. I'm a bureaucrat, Adele. I can't just walk you through the front door. Adele stared darkly at her for another second before breaking into a smile. No. I'm going to walk you through the front door. He cast the rain slicker to the ground and lit his lightsaber. As ever. 
You lead the way. The Kashiri in the hallway had been dead for at least a day, perhaps more. Quora recognized their uniforms of office, a couple of guards first, followed by a mix of administrators and aides farther in. The building hadn't been stormed, there was no evidence of a vigorous defense at the doorway. Just surprised, mutilated Kashiri. Some of the burn marks looked to her like lightsaber wounds. But not all. She covered her mouth. I worked with these people. Not anymore, Adel said, stepping over the corpses. He looked down the hallway, on alert. This floor isn't anything, is it? Everything important is underground. Yes, she said, wishing she'd dared to sneak along a weapon from her visit to her office. Adele's malice she'd grown accustomed to. The feeling here, however, was of pervasive evil. And it was spreading. The glow lamps were already lit at the foot of the stairs. Off the main hallway they found a sitting room, nicely appointed except for the dead Kashiri guard lying at the foot of a large tapestry. Adele looked up at the image. An elderly Kashiri female. Her thinning white hair framed a tired, almost one expression. That's an ugly woman, he said. You're just saying that because you know who it is, she said. Adarival. She'd stood many times in this room while waiting to see the war cabinet, admiring the tapestry that stood under perpetual guard. It depicted the great Kashiri as she looked at the end, not the young figure from the historical reviews. The pure endurance the image suggested had perked her up in the past. Now the tapestry's honor guard was dead, as was everyone else. The war cabinet's meeting room was a mortuary, all the major figures of Alanciari politics slumped under the table or across it. Again, no sign of a last stand whoever had entered had come in the night, and with total surprise. No, Adele said, golden eyes wide. This isn't where he'd stay. Follow me. Who? Just follow me and stay close. Corson Bentadu sat in a tall back chair, looking like an arachnoid in a jungle web. And a web, it was. Quora had called the room the World Watch moments earlier and Adele had been certain of the existence of such a place all along. All the signalers had to be routing their messages through somewhere. He'd assumed there were subsidiary hubs, a sensible move, for reasons of both speed and redundancy. But as he'd seen the martial nature of a Lanciari life, he realized how much was centralized. A message from Point Defiance to Garrow's neck might be a direct connection, but everything else routed through the center first. The center was here, and Bentadu was at it, looking much changed. His head bore the scars of burns several days old. Not debilitating, but obviously painful, his bushy brows singed completely off. Red and purple stained his uniform. You survived! Bentadu said, his deep voice craggier than Adele remembered. I thought it was you I sensed. Come in, Vray. See what we've done with the place. Adele stepped inside the doorway, guarded on either side by Bentado's Sith henchmen. Quora waited nervously behind. Bring your guide, Bentadu said, wincing as he stood. She's the reason you're here. Adele deactivated his lightsaber and took Quora's wrist to lead her inside. It was the room he'd suspected, all right. A large round facility buried beneath the tower, with personnel running up and down the steps bearing dispatches. Meter square gratings in the ceiling cast light upon a raised surface in the middle of the room. There sat a great map of a Lancier, astonishingly similar to the one that existed in the palace in Tov, except for the complex network of signal stations and fortresses indicated on it. Idel looked at the messengers. Many he recognized from Bentado's massive Yaru crew but others were from different vessels. Mostly human warriors, but there were also a few of their Kashiri ambassadors in the mix, including Squab, who brought a sheaf of parchment to his limping master. Rough landing, Bentadu said. We cut the gondola loose as soon as we cleared the top of the ridge, 
He grinned through broken teeth. Your hydrogen was a bad idea. It got us here, Adele said, growing more aware. He belonged here, among the other Sith, but something wasn't right. He walked to the map, and then looked back at the room. They're great builders here, but this can't be the hub of all their communications. No. There are at least 13 buildings in this city processing messages. We found one after we landed. It's what led us here. One of the facilities even gets messages from Force users. If you can believe that. But all the important messages are copied here, or begin here. Once we found the place, it was just a matter of getting inside without drawing attention. <laughs> he laughed. I usually leave finesse to others, but you can see some of my handiwork around the building. Adele looked up the steps to the tower. That's how you rounded up the other survivors of your fleet. And drew you here. Bentadu said, nodding at Quora. We use the signal station to call out for everything, even to have the gates opened. It was one thing when we got the Kashiri to deliver food inside the gate, but the fools have been delivering us their prisoners, too. Idel looked at Cora. She stood in stone-faced astonishment, her hand over her mouth. He could see the recognition seeping into those enormous eyes. The organization that had provided Alancia its strength had also proved its weakness. He'd held some inkling this might be possible, it was part of what had drawn him so relentlessly to Seuss Mintry. But Bentadu had arrived first, and with the same idea. The glory would be his. Cancel the alarms, everywhere, Bentadu ordered. Squab shuffled back to the foot of the stairs with the command. Less than a minute later, the shrill whistles above Seuss Mintry stopped, as they soon would across the entire continent. Bring everyone to a ready state. For when the next wave arrives. The next wave? Idel asked. The next wave of Sith. There were airships left behind in Keshta. I expect we'll see them soon. Idel raised his eyebrows. Then we need to get word back home before they leave. You may be able to order the Kashiri around from here, but I expect whatever you say... The Alanciari will still shoot at our airships. I agree, Bentadu said, smiling darkly. And, and that's, that's exactly, exactly what I want, what them, I to want do. them to do. 13. Idel reeled. You want the Kashiri to destroy our ships, not our ships, Bentadu said, looming over the giant map. A dozen miniature airship models sat off the western edge. They will destroy the ships of the tribe. But we're all part of the tribe. Are we? The scar above Bentado's eye tilted. We spent so much time trying to rebuild. Idel said, barely conscious of Quora watching intently from the side. I don't see what sense it makes to tear it apart. Don't play innocent. You and your Golden Destiny people were tearing the tribe apart for years. Just as my people were. He gestured to the Sith in the room. Perdition, Idel. You were right alongside us in the crisis showing us how to destroy the temple. It wasn't one of my better moments. No. Of course not. But I don't propose to destroy what we rebuilt. I'm talking about a second tribe here on Alancia. A second? Idel was startled. He'd never considered such a thing. It's simple. There's no path to the Grand Lordship so long as Hiltz lives. And Ileana... His mouth curled evilly around the name of the royal consort, drawing the word out to twice its length. 
She'll see to it that Hiltz will live until you and I are too old to care. Bentadu limped around the map. You said it yourself. The Kashiri here were superior to ours back home. And I don't just mean this waste of flesh here that Hiltz saddled with me. He said, slapping a heavy hand on Squab's gnarled shoulder. Yaru Corson found sculptors and painters. We have found a warrior race, builders and armorers. The Alanciari are special, Idel said, nodding toward Quora. Truly amazing, but they're all Kashiri. The potential exists in the people of our continent, too. Do you have two thousand years to train them? Bentadu snorted. Idel looked back at the human guards by the door. They'd heard it all and done nothing. His people, Bentadu had said. His hand-picked crews, Idel realized. How many had come from Bentado's old Corsonite League? Why hadn't he paid more attention? Bentadu ran his gloved hand over the surface of the map. It's perfect, you know. A perfect solution. The problem with the Sith is what it always was. We're taught the glorification of self and the subjugation of others. The individual is truly free only when all chains are broken, when no one can limit his actions by resisting his will. The perfect Sith must control everything and everyone. He lifted the airship miniatures with the force. The little dirigibles bobbed in the air, hovering like the real thing. But effecting that control, that is where the matter always fails. There are too many variables, too many slaves aspiring toward something other than your glory. Too many would-be Sith working in opposite directions. With a flick of his wrist, the mini airships went tumbling across the table. Pandemonium! Idel said nothing. Bentadu always spoke like this. The man belonged on stage with the other actors. When I was young, I thought Yaru Corson had the solution. You remember? He'd tricked the Kashiri into believing in him. He didn't conquer. He walked in and turned the key. He had the first part right, but not the second. The result was his own death and a lost millennium. But here... Bentadu paused to pick up a model of a signal station. Here I can do it all again, and do it right. Like Corson, I've been cast down from the sky upon these shores. Here there's a working system of government, to be bent to my will, glove to my hand. And here there are no Sith. Idel considered the words. Whatever he thought of the source, the idea was interesting. A solitary Sith Lord might never get a multitude to work on his or her behalf, unless it was already working. A Lancier was a beating heart, keeping its armies prepared through force of habit. It only required a Sith Lord to step in at the top, without disturbing the operations of the great machine. It is a good idea, High Lord. Very good. Someone should remember it. For when we take on the Galactic Republic... Bentadu smiled. There is one problem with doing it in Alancia, of course. You're not the only Sith here. The people in this building are loyal. They'll work for me. For how long cooped up here? They're human. They can't go outside or the Kashiri will spot them as different right away. They didn't spot you. He had help, Cora said, speaking up for the first time. Motivated help. I promise no one else will help you once they find you're here. Glaring, she pointed toward the exit with her thumb. And you've killed our leaders. 
In the bunker or no, my people will eventually come looking for them. Adele read frustration on his rival's face. No, Bentadu wouldn't have thought very far. And he knew something Bentadu didn't, that he hadn't even told Cora. The next airships may arrive sooner than you expect. We need to begin thinking of how to bring them in safely. This plan of yours, it's interesting. But we'll accomplish more as one tribe. Then may the best tribe win. No, we're not going to do this again. Adele shot a glance at Quora, urging her toward the exit with his eyes. Seeing her begin to move, he stepped over to the guards. High Lord Bintadu has established control over the Kashiri of this continent. You will help him until reinforcements arrive. Then we'll work together to consolidate power here, in the name of the tribe and Grand Lord Hiltz. Bentadu let out an exasperated sigh. <sighs> you always were a bore. He commanded the guards. Take him. Bentado's thugs at the door took one step forward, but no more. Adele was already in motion, lightsaber activated. One arcing blow to both their midsections cleared the path. Cora, let's go! Cora bolted through the door, past Adele and his glowing lightsaber. He turned in the doorway to follow her, and screamed. No! Cora looked in horror as lightning lit the dark hallway. From the World Watch, Corson Bentadu stepped deliberately forward, his one hand alight with strange blue tendrils of energy. Adele quaked under the assault, dropping his lightsaber. Her eyes darted to the floor, and the sight she'd seen when she entered. The Sith hadn't bothered to strip the dead Kashiri guarding the room of their weapons. Hitting the ground, Quora grabbed a repeating hand ballista, rolled, and fired. Glass shards launched past Adele. No! Bentadu howled in pain as one lodged in his stub of a left arm, terminating the electric display. Still crackling, Adele fell backward into her free arm. She fired again. Driving Bentadu and his aide squad back to cover. Her weapon emptied, she drew Adele's fallen lightsaber from the floor into her hand with the force. Now Cora led the way, helping the staggered Sith through the maze of hallways. She smashed the fire globes lighting the place as she went, darkness would be her friend for a change. She could hear Bentado's crew moving into the halls again behind her, but she knew where she was. She hadn't understood all the Sith had said, but she had to tell the world outside, the system had been compromised. Huffing, she reached the anteroom outside the war cabinet's chamber. Across the room were the steep stairs leading to the surface level. But as she turned for them, Adele fell to the floor, still in agony from the Sith attack. She didn't know what Bentadu had done to him, but Adele clearly had never experienced it before. She tried to help him sit up, and remembered in a flash doing the exact same thing with Jogan on Point Defiance, days earlier. Too many days earlier. Cora rose, staggered by a realization. I'm out of time, Adele. I have to go. Adele coughed loudly. <coughs> what are you talking about? I've got to warn people, don't try to stop me. Then I've got to go. It's been ten days since we left the ship. Even on Yuvak it'll take two days to get back to Miori Cove and the Mischance. She tried to help him stand, please come with me. If we don't get back, your crew will kill him. The High Lord doubled over in pain. Cora struggled to keep him up, but failed. I'll go alone if I have to. No, stay Cora. This is important. Stay to help me. I can't. Cora rose and looked toward the stairs. I have to go. She was to the bottom step when she heard him call out. Cora, they're not there. What? I told you Miss Chance remained so you would guide me here. Adele said, struggling to sit up. 
I sent them home. Home. She ran back to the side. Home where? To Keshta. To our continent. With Jogan? If he lived, he sure wasn't going anywhere on his own. They left as soon as you and I reached shore. Blast you. Quora turned back to the stairway and halted suddenly. There were footsteps up there. Did Bentadu have people hidden above? And now there were voices in the dark hallway. Behind her, Adele struggled to get to his knees. She still had his lightsaber. Cora, they'll kill us both. Then everyone loses. Cora froze for a second, unsure of what to do. She stepped back toward Adele, who fell against her. Feeling his weight, she looked urgently at the doorways, and then at the tapestry right behind her. Adari Val looked down on her, silent as ever as the clamor outside and on the stairs grew louder. She called out, Rock of Kesh, save your daughter. She felt a tremor through the force, slight, almost like a gust of wind, coming from the direction of the tapestry. Quora's eyes widened. Yes. With no time to fear historic disrespect, she pulled the fabric aside, and looked into the darkness of the hidden room beyond. Placing Adele's arm over her shoulder, she plunged recklessly with him into the void. Fourteen. For the second time in two weeks, Quora cared for an injured man while Sith stalked nearby. But the location could hardly have been more different. She was not at Jogan's signal station or on the deck of a ship, she was in the greatest sanctum of all Alansir, the library of Adarival. The Sith remained outside beyond the tapestry, and noisily so. There had never been fewer than three voices out there at once in the long hours since she'd entered. There was no going outside, but there was still a chance to warn her people. For two hours, she'd reached out to other thought criers through the Force, uncaring of whether the Sith sensed her presence. The Force was one communications system the Sith couldn't compromise. Or so she thought. Between the anger emanating from the Sith and the near-toxic levels of fear that had developed among the Alansiari over recent days, calling into the Force felt like death by drowning. There was no way anyone could make out what she was trying to say. She was too tired, and too fearful herself. And angry. For more long hours, she'd glared at Adele as he slept, recuperating from his ordeal. He'd lied to her the whole way. She knew the rugged southern coast. There weren't many settlements or fortresses, the snow-capped mountains were their own defense. Mischance could put out to sea unmolested. But with autumn in the south, Alansiari mariners avoided the southern passage because of its rocket-fast polar currents and the spread of ice. Did an inexperienced crew have a chance of reaching the eastern ocean? And would Jogan warn them, or would he remain silent, willing to founder with them if necessary? If he did warn them, would they even listen? Quora had realized with a start that she didn't really know what Jogan would do. She'd imagined she knew his private thoughts but what she actually had was a stack of messages and a few hours at his side. And she nearly upended her whole life for him. And what of Adele? He and his people had upended her entire world. And yet she'd saved him, even after knowing he had lied. Why? She went over the scene in the World Watch. Adele did seem different from Bentadu. A murderer, to be sure, but Adele was a builder, not a fighter. He seemed to be interested in something larger. Still, were Sith ever interested in anything larger than themselves? Didn't that defeat the point of being Sith? She didn't trust him. But she hadn't been able to abandon him, either. What was happening to her? Quora slept fitfully, often waking to hear the voices outside. But they came no closer, and in the morning, light entered the room from a diagonal shaft overhead. The concrete tunnel narrowed too much at the top to serve as an exit, but the illumination provided the chance to do something while the High Lord slept. She reached for a book. She'd read the same Keshta chronicles everyone else had. The transcribed interviews with the freedom-fighting geologist about her former life were mandatory as soon as children learned to read. They were the basis, loosely, of course, for what appeared in the plays. 
but it was known that Adarival had produced other writings during her exile in Alansir. Some were biographical works about the Sith, others provided a detailed description of her continent. A sizable body of her work compared and contrasted the minerals of the two continents, even the most devoted Val scholars had trouble getting through that material. Her support for the theory that the ancient cataclysm severed access between Keshta and Alansir was the only thing of much interest there. But the book Quora held now was something different. The pages were not in calligraphy but in someone's scrawl. Adari's own hand? It didn't seem possible to Quora, who now took extra care leafing through the pages. But whether the document was original or a handmade copy from centuries later, it was something she had never seen, Adari's personal memoirs. Eagerly, Quora skimmed the writings, feeling all the excitement she had always gotten when reading missives from Jogan. There were many regret-filled sections about Adari's sons, particularly Tana, who had been left behind. There were a few tart passages about Adari's mother, Yulan, and not much at all about her first marriage to Jari. But, turning the page, she saw the writer's hand quicken, the letters slant. It was about Yaru Corson, the captain of Omen and first Grand Lord of the tribe. Corson had touched Adari's mind from afar long before their first meeting, and she mentioned that sensation more than once. It had been unnerving then, and every time he did it after that. Quora understood Adari's unease, for she had felt it when trying to communicate mentally with other Kashiri not attuned to the Force. She didn't do it often because it didn't always work, and there wasn't any practical need for it anyway. As a thought crier, she'd only communicated with other Force users. But she tried to reach out to her husband telepathically, and the response had been a sickened expression from him. Was that what Adari felt, the first Kashiri ever to be contacted through the Force? Quora imagined her discomfort. And that discomfort lived on every page after that, where Adari described the jealousy aimed at her by Sila, Yaru's wife among the humans. Mental vitriol, broadcast at her every time Yaru wasn't immediately nearby. Not that he ever stopped Sila when he was around, Adari wrote that he enjoyed seeing the two of them set against each other. This behavior wasn't Sith, Adari wrote, this was male. But what aggravated Adari was that she had willingly placed herself in that position, and not just to gain intelligence for her resistance movement. Yaru has a sharper mind than anyone I have ever met. Fencing with him verbally was like one of his lightsaber fights, I felt completely awake and alive. Even now, decades later, I remember waking up in the morning and wanting the next conversation to begin. Walking with him as other Kashiri and Sith knelt down was like being at the center of the world. But I can never forget the other feeling. The way I felt that first day at the mountain, when Sila and her kind ripped at my mind. Yaru is smart, clever, and charming, and uses those things to rule the others, and me. But he is also a chief among Sith, and that means he is vain, ruthless, and sadistic. This is a man who killed his brother for the sake of convenience. If Yaru yet lives, he has probably done worse still. This is an animal. As a young woman, I was part of a match made for advantage. The problem is that it defines you as unequal before it even starts. Let any woman who considers a Sith beware, strong women do not walk alongside animals. Not without a leash. Cora shut the book, suddenly chilled. She understood now why no one had ever seen the memoirs, when so much else about Adari Val had been required reading. The leader of the Sith had tempted her. And the Rock of Kesh had faltered. She looked over at Adele, shifting in his sleep. She still had the lightsaber. She could remove one threat, a threat to her people and possibly to herself. She didn't love him, but she didn't hate him either, not yet, and he would always play on that. He'd already started that, all along their journey. She had a chance to stop it now. But she also had a question. Wake up, she said quietly, jostling him. Adele let out a muffled groan. Ugh. Are they still out there? Yes. Three or four, I think. Can you take them? He sat up on his elbow and winced. Uh, no. But maybe we can. He saw his lightsaber in her hand. Getting to know that... I have a question, Quora said, 
Face serious. You said more people are coming. And that you and they serve someone else. Is this person as bad as that Bentadu is? Startled by the question, Adele looked closely at her. No. No, he is not. The Grand Lord is old, but wise. You like him, she said, surprised at what she was sensing. He's your friend. Almost in spite of himself, Adele smiled weakly. Yes, I suppose he is. If you had to live under a Sith, you'd rather live under him and me than Bintadu. Trust me, we've had much worse. The aqueducts. You said they'd fallen apart. They fell to ruin because of some of your leaders. And some who wanted to lead. There was a thousand years of chaos, Cora. If Alancia believes in building things like I do, you can't let that start again. You've got to help me. She studied him and reached a decision. Adari was right, but I'm right, too. Some animals are better than others. Okay, she said, rising. But get something straight. I'm not helping you for you or for me. I'm going to stop Bentadu and put things right. I'm doing this for my people. That's the same as doing it for you. But we'll discuss Sith philosophy later. There's work to be done. We have to cut off Bintadu's communications. But if we try to go to your people, they'll cut me to pieces. Which they'll also do if you go alone for help and they find me here. If we still had your ballista, we could shoot out the fire globes on the signal tower. That would take forever. And then both sides would cut us to pieces. <sighs> I assume you've already tried to reach for help through the Force? She nodded. Which means the only way to stop Bintadu is to stop Bintadu. Adele clasped his hands, deep in thought. This is his normal mode, she realized. Calculating, not fighting. Golden eyes opened a second later, and looked up. Okay, I've got it. We'll still have to fight, though. Too bad we only have the one weapon. Quora stood up. No problem. If this is where they moved Adari Val's archives, there's supposed to be another lightsaber around here. If there is, then she stole it. Good for her, then. She winked. And better for us. I always wanted to try one out. Fifteen. An airship has arrived. Squab reported. Off the western coast, near Port Melifos. The first of the wave. His master said. White teeth ground as Bentadu pulled glass shavings from his own arm. Have the Kashiri fired on it? No, my lord. The aide squeaked. The vessel is kilometers out. UVAC Diamond Flak teams are heading to engage. Tell them to signal when they bring it down. Strike on sight command is given to all positions up and down the line. We left Hilts with sixteen ships. Here's hoping he sent them all. Adele winced as he watched the Sith pull out another bloody sliver. He could almost feel Bentado's pain up here in the shaft looking down on the World Watch. Adele had realized on seeing the diagonal tunnel leading upward from the secret archives that the concrete bunker, where so many Kashiri expected to live and work for days at a time, had to have a ventilation system. Since quite a lot of the facility was under either the brick house or the signal tower on the surface, the ducts for some rooms necessarily traveled diagonally, intersecting others. He'd seen it in some of the ancient buildings of Tov. The Alanciari had used concrete in this modern construction, but their thinking wasn't much different from that of the Kashiri architects he knew back home. There was no escaping the duct in the secret room at its narrow top but hoisting Quora into the space revealed to her a slot a meter square leading down in a different direction. A comfortable enough crawl space, 
it slanted upward and downward as it met junctures above barracks and supply rooms. A vile stench told them when they were over the war cabinet room. And now they were over Bentado's sanctum, looking down separately from parallel shafts. Where's the word from Port Melaphos? What's taking so long? Idel saw Bentado's scarred dome directly beneath, as the man looked over the map surface. Here goes nothing. His feet braced against the grating, Idel reached down through the force and knocked several of the miniatures over. Startled, Bentadu bent over to recover them, just as Idel brought his legs together, smashing through the wooden lattice with his boots. One high lord slammed into the other, driving Bentado's head into the map surface. Idel rolled across the fake countryside, igniting his lightsaber even as, meters away, Quora smashed down, startling little squab. Idel turned to see a black-suited crew woman dash to Bentado's defense. Idel shoved her back through the force, but the distraction gave Bentadu the chance to recover. The massive Sith snared Adele's ankle and sent him smashing downward, back first. From the side, Quora lunged, holding the ancient purloined lightsaber before her like the bayonets she'd trained with. Bentadu ignited his lightsaber and deflected hers in a windmill motion, made awkward by his stance half standing in a mountain range. Adele rolled backward off the map surface, and into the oncoming assault of another Bentadu defender. He lunged with his weapon, impaling the attacker. Idel. The tower. Idel looked back to see Quora scrambling toward the steps of the tower. Squab was already on them, disappearing into the heights above. No! Bentadu yelled, charging after her as best he could with his bad leg. Blast you, woman! Idel struggled to follow, slaying another black suit as he went. This was no good. Quora could undo Bentado's hold on a lancier from the tower, but she could also bring down a host of Kashiri onto his head. Cora, no! He found her gasping in one of the lower belfries. Bentadu had thrown her against the wall, knocking away her lightsaber. Stay back, Idel. Glistening with sweat, Bentadu pointed the tip of the lightsaber at her neck. If this purple thing means anything to you, Stay. Back. Idel looked to his side. Squab cowered near him, behind the wooden spiral staircase leading upward. I don't suppose two can play this game. Idel said, threatening the hunchback. Squab? Ha <laughs> ha. Do what you want. I can find more Kashiri. There's a whole continent full here. He sneered at Quora. Is this one special? Forget me, Idel. Quora yelled. You stab this filthy animal. Move, and she dies. Idel breathed deeply, and stepped back. He lowered his lightsaber, but did not deactivate it. <sighs> She's been a big help, Bintadu. It's rude for guests to kill their hosts. Fool! Bentadu said, projecting through the force. Idel went flying, his head striking the concrete wall opposite his attacker. The lightsaber flew from his hand. Bentadu kicked Idel's weapon away and flung Quora to Idel's side. Squab, recovering his wits, emerged from hiding, and Bentadu directed him to pick up Quora's ancient lightsaber. Just hold that one. I'll take care of these two myself. Lightsaber glistening in his hand, he approached the injured combatants. Next to the stairwell, a cable tugged, ringing a glass bell. Squab, holding the old lightsaber, looked to his master. Call coming in. Well, get it. Squab hobbled partway upstairs, where he was passed a slip of parchment from another of Bentado's Kashiri. The signalers at Port Melaphos report that the airship is landed. It's been brought down, you mean? No. They say it landed. What are you talking about? I gave the command to strike. Another message passed down the steps. 
Squab looked at it, and then looked at it again. The message appears to be from Grand Lord Hilt, sir. He says he has arrived. Still woozy, Adele looked at Quora, stunned. Bentado's jaw dropped. He yelled up the stairwell. You tell him that Corson Bentado and the Kashiri of Alansia welcome him and tell the troops to kill him and anyone with him now. Seconds passed with only the sounds of the upstairs signal apparatus filling the room. Finally, one of Bentado's Kashiri henchmen stepped down the stairs, looking puzzled. Well, what is it? Grand Lord Hiltz sends just a single word, my lord. The courier said, straightening and stepping forward. Regards. Regards. Idel looked on, confused. To Bentado's side, Squab's black eyes narrowed on hearing the word. Veins bulged in his master's neck. The lightsaber wavered in Bentado's angry grip. Do they toy with me? He turned, looming over his prisoners. Is this some kind of... Bentado's eyes widened obscenely as the lightsaber thrust into his back found his blackened heart. He fell first onto his knees, and then his face. Little Squab looked down at his master's motionless form. Kneeling, the gnarled Kashiri deactivated Adari Val's stolen weapon and disarmed his dead master. Idel could barely speak. Squab? I'm sure the Hilt's family has a better greeting for you, Hi, Lord Vray. The hunchback bowed and passed Idel the weapons. And I'm sure they would like to deliver it in person. Sixteen. The white airship sat grandly over the Seuss Mintry parade grounds. The same size as Yaru, good omen differed in practically every other regard. In place of the dark, fearsome design, the golden inlay in the canvas traced the image of a mighty avian creature, its beak curling into a happy smile. Jewels and tassels dangled from the envelope. Silken bunting surrounded the enclosed gondola giving the appearance that a puffy cloud had descended from the sky to hover just meters over the amassed Kashiri army, standing at attention. Quora stood at the receiving stand alongside Adele, who waited expectantly, and openly, amid the surviving city leaders. He seemed to look on the airship with absolute delight. That's the royal vehicle you were working on? she asked. Yes, but they've made some changes to the exterior. They worked fast. It had already stopped once in Port Malefos, descending first at sea shy of the range of the Kashiri Ballisti. A passenger had then emerged on the forward balcony to hail the Yuvak riding defenders, the same passenger who now emerged in the same place. Quora already knew who it was. Jogan Halder stood at the railing, wearing his Alancier military uniform and seemingly unbowed by his injuries. Kashiri of Alanciar! I have been beyond the ocean. Let me tell you what I have seen. A hush fell over the regiments. I was taken from our shores by these beings, these humans, who have been described to us as the Sith. I did not go willingly, and whatever happened, I was determined to protect Alansiar. I was blindfolded soon after the mischance sighted land, but I had time to see a lush country ahead, like the one described by Adari Val. I was rushed inland in a wheeled cart, while some of my captors went ahead and were joined by others. He clapped his hands on the railing. Again, I was determined to say nothing, no matter what torture they brought. His expression softened. But then... We reached the smooth stone paths of a city, and I was released. And I mean completely released, allowed to walk freely through the streets. And what streets? A magnificent shining city with glass spires rising to the sky, more beautiful than anything I've ever seen. And the city was alive with nothing but Kashiri. 
A murmur arose from the crowd. I know what you're saying now, because I thought it too. The Herald told us ages ago that the land wasn't really theirs, and that the Kashiri weren't really free. But I didn't see the humans anywhere. Even those who had been my captors vanished soon after my release. I didn't want to talk to these Kashiri. They look like us, but we know they're living under tyranny. How like us could they be? He spread his hands theatrically. But I didn't see any tyranny. I saw craftspeople spending their days not at hard labor, but making art in the streets. Painting, sculpting, music and singing of the sort we save for holidays, right there in the open plazas. I thought it was a festival and that the humans had staged it to deceive me. As the hours passed, I realized this was how they lived. Kashiri artisans greeted me, recognizing I was a foreigner from my uniform. They asked about my land. Again, I said nothing. But they happily told me of theirs, confirming that the sights I was seeing were normal. I asked where the humans were. They pointed to what they called the capital an ancient marble building augmented with glass towers. It was the refuge, they said, of the protectors. This time, a loud rumble came from the crowd. Jogan placed his hands before him, palms open. Yes, yes, I know. The Herald warned us that the Sith had fooled the people of Keshta into thinking they were the protectors of legend. I objected to the term, tried to tell them that they'd been fooled, but they didn't argue. Instead, they allowed me to continue around the city, called Tav, just as Adari had described, to speak to whomever I wanted. Convinced that they really felt as they said, I tried to change their minds. I described Alanciar and how we'd prepared for the coming of the Sith. I described how we've lived and everything we've done, and the response was pity, pity over so many years lost to worry, to fear over an existential threat, pity over so many lives spent in drudgery rather than craft, and pity that we had never known the humans with their wisdom from the stars. Humans, whom I was told did not lord over the Kashiri, but rather stayed always inside their capital, in quiet contemplation. I asked to be taken to the capital to see for myself. They took me willingly, and I was welcomed inside. There, indeed, the humans we call Sith, unarmed and in meditation, I was led to a chamber where their ruling circle sat. No man or woman ranked above any other. There's art in the telling, Quora thought. Just like in those sheaves of messages he sent her for months. It was what had attracted her to him in the first place. He certainly had everyone's attention now. I didn't want to speak. And so they spoke, welcoming me to Keshta and apologizing for the method of my arrival. There I was told the same tale of their people's landing on Kesh that Adari told, more or less. They knew of Adari Val and said she was not wrong in her warnings. There were evil ones among their number in those early days, servants of the destructors, in hiding. The crowd rumbled anxiously. They were aware of the danger Adari feared and put down those dark beings the day that she left their continent for hours. Had Adari waited but another day, just one more day. Jogan stopped, his throat dry. All stood silent as they waited for him to continue. In just another day, all those that Adari feared would have been destroyed and her warning, meaningless. A collective cry came from the forces. No. 
No. Yes. I now know they were attacking here, even as I was visiting there. Murmurs increasing in volume, he pressed on. I asked about the first airships we saw, those of Adele Vray, whose warriors accosted and kidnapped me. The human counselors told me that Vray was a trusted friend who had come in search of the criminals. Startled by the swiftness and technological power of our defense, Vray feared that we served the destructors too. And that, my friends, is why they brought me to Keshta. They had to know that we were not the vile enemies of legend. That's when I spoke at last, telling them that we were on the side of good, that we would resist any evil that came our way. We weren't deserving of their wrath. No, not a Lanciar. Jogan saved us all! Came a cry from the masses. And the humans, the Sith, were glad of it, and they offered to help. A cheer went up, and Korra's eyes widened with realization. He's the new Herald. Jogan was the new Adari, only this one told tales pleasing to the Sith. Quora looked into the crowd of listeners, urgently scanning face after face. They were taking Jogan seriously. It was an incredible tale, but he was one of their own. Well, so am I, she thought. And she had a story to tell, too. Casting a surreptitious glance at Adele, Quora turned toward the railing. She'd felt a paralysis since the moment in the tower over Val Hall when Adele reasserted control over Bentado's crew and the signaling devices. There'd been no chance to warn anyone. But here was the better part of an Alanciari legion, just footsteps away from the receiving stand. Maybe it wasn't all over. Adele would try to silence her, but it would put an end to this show, while there was still some doubt. But don't take it from me. Jogan said, stepping aside to allow a new figure onto the balcony. There's someone you should all meet. A flush of white appeared at the railing. An ancient human male, clad in a cloak of gem festooned feathers and wearing a sharp beak, raised his arm wings and looked to the sky. Recognizing the bright Tuash, legendary avian creature of their myths, the crowd gasped. Only Adele, gawking, laughed aloud. Incredulous, he looked at Quora. Grand Lord Hiltz! People of Alancia, I have come to you as the Keshborn minion of the Bright Tuash. The old man said, I am more than two thousand years old. The humans are among my children, and so are you. Your herald, Adari Val, was my Keshiri daughter. Well-meaning but lacking in understanding. He clapped a feathered arm on Jogan's shoulder. This son of Alancia spoke true. There were servants of the Destructors among my people, but they were not all of my people. We cast them out. When you so kindly welcomed me at Port Melephos, my heart rose until I received the sad story that the renegades had struck here already, killing your great leaders. He bowed his head sadly. The fact was already known to the audience, but the human's show of remorse commanded the attention of all. Hilt squinted toward the reviewing stand and pointed. But the evil ones and their leader have been put down thanks to the efforts of one of my agents, working in concert with one of your well-trained Alanciari. Thousands of eyes turned toward Adele and Quora. The defeat of Bentadu was known, too, but many marveled to see the two together. A human, secretly working in Alancier to defeat the Destructors. My people feel responsible for all that has happened. In the coming days, relief workers will arrive, human and Kashiri, dressed in white to help put right the damage. 
to build bridges between our worlds. Applause already beginning. Bird Hilts raised his wings. Together, we may understand each other and make for a better cash for all of us. The crowd roared its approval. Quora looked around. There were Force users here, studying the old man as she was. But no one had raised an alarm. I sense no malice in him. Idel said. He never had any for you. There's still deception, she said. Maybe these people are ready to be deceived. They're like one of your ballistae. They've been cocked for years, waiting to go off. Now that they've fired, they're ready for something else. Even a pretty story. She looked up. Yes, Jogan had given it to them. What could she say now? The blimp descended now, allowing her one-time correspondent to open the gate to the ground. There's more to my story, but I need to get to a signal station. This story needs to be told to everyone. And if you don't mind... He said, smiling broadly. I'd like to be the one to send it. Jogan stepped from the gondola into the crowd. Quora descended from the receiving stand but couldn't get near him, so mobbed was he with curious Kashiri. She dashed along, trying in vain to catch up with the moving crowd before hopping on top of a stone retaining wall. Jogan, she yelled. Jogan looked left and right before spotting her. Grinning, he pointed to her with one hand and himself with another. We'll talk, he mouthed, before being swept toward the signal station at the edge of the parade grounds. Idel smiled. Grand Lord, welcome. The Alanciari listeners had pulled back and were now meeting in large groups with the Kashiri ambassadors from the Good Omen. Hilts had brought no other humans, but they would be along in vessels to come. The aged Grand Lord brought Idel close for an embrace, and then spoke, cracked lips to the younger man's ear. That was the worst blasted thing I've ever done he said, waving the beak. The costume? Or riding on the airship? Both! Idel looked back at the massive vessel. No one had ever known the Grand Lord to ride in Yvac. It does make flight available to those who can't ride. We could do a lot with them. The people of Kesh are puffed up enough, my boy. Hilt said, fluffing the feathers of his cloak. It's no way to tie together an empire. They have more of the sea vessels. In the harbors. We don't know how many can make the transit, but that's because they simply haven't tried. Obviously, Pepin and the Mischance made it. Of course. I was hoping to see you with them, but they told me you had scouted ahead. Good thing that... And good thing you sent us that talkative fellow. And his reading collection. It was a lot of romantic claptrap mostly. But he also had a copy of this. He pulled forth a volume from inside the cloak. His copy of the Keshta Chronicles. This book told us what we were up against. Everything the Alanciari knew about us. A Dari Vol's testament, Idel said, shaking his head. The Kashiri runaway did a lot of damage. Not as much as you might think. You people snicker at me and my histories. But history is important. It can be a weapon for both sides. Your lieutenant read it during the crossing and flew ahead with it to Tav when she reached the shore. It was clear that the Kashiri in Alansia had once been like ours in the beginning, right down to the same myth of the protectors and the destructors. And now, like then, 
It was simply a matter of convincing them of who we were in the story, and that meant choosing a role for Bintadu. But Bintadu's fleet must have already left by then. And there was no recalling the headstrong fool. We knew his invaders would give the Alanciari the fight they'd been waiting for. A fight they'd probably win. So we used that. He and his ships and people looked like the face of evil. We had to look like something else. Luckily, you'd sent us a test subject. By the time the cart with Jogan reached Tov, Hiltz explained, the tribe had withdrawn from public view, putting its most fervently loyal Kashiri on the streets. Once their new ambassador had been convinced, it was a simple matter of assuming a pleasing shape for the Alanciari at large. Bintadu's team looked like what they were afraid of, but I am a kindly old man, weighing a coat of white feathers. The things I do for the tribe. I read your signals about Bintadu turning. Well, that was only a matter of time. I'm glad you were here to take care of him. I started, but Squab finished him. The old man pushed a feather from his face and smiled. Loyal little Squab. Another idea of Ileana's. There's a word of advice for you, my lad. When a Grand Lord of the Sith sends his regards, run. <laughs> Idel laughed. But as he thought on it, his expression changed to a frown. It could all begin again, Grand Lord. The Sith infighting. Our mission is done. Is it? Capturing new slaves isn't victory. Any lout with a blade can do that, like the original Sith did to our Tapani ancestors. But bringing them into service willingly, now that's something. It's going to take all of our efforts together. That's what Yaru Korsen thought, and it's good enough for me. You're right, of course. Of course I am. I'm old. Hiltz drew his protege closer and took his arm. Here, let me tell you about the history I'm working on. 17. Many wanted to meet the leader of the misunderstood humans, but Quora hadn't stayed to greet the Grand Lord. Idel figured she'd gone after Jogan, but no one on the parade grounds had seen her. He'd later learned she'd gone to help with the cleanup at Val Hall. Squab and Bentado surviving Kashiri, now under Adele's direction, had held the all-important signal tower until the white-suited human advisors arrived. Just days after Jogan's testament, there were several in the streets of Seuss Mintry, appearing kind and helpful. Adele moved freely on the streets in his own white togs now, neither invader nor overlord but benevolent guest. The Sith had been kind and generous with beautiful gifts from across the ocean, and the Alanciari knew how to do one thing very well, spread the word. Idel now was essentially governor of Alancier for Hiltz, but it would take years of smiling cooperation for the rule to be fully accepted and openly acknowledged. The High Lord faced many of the same challenges that the crew of Omen had, and in ways his job was more complicated. Every village, every state farm here contained some Kashiri innovation unknown on the other side of the globe. All had to be evaluated. Some advances would be brought to Keshta, the sailing vessels were an obvious choice to replace the dangerous airships. Vast areas of Kesh, like the unknown northern hemisphere, absent from Corson's ancient map, might now become accessible. Could there be more natives, more mysteries there? The prospect excited Adele. There was even talk of raising a couple of artificial reefs in the ocean, to provide Yuvak with rest stations as they made oceanic crossings. The continents had once been joined, there would be connections again. The ships were one thing, but many other Alanciari technologies would be retired. They would slowly but firmly urge the locals to burn their ballistae, large and small, in a show of trust. It wasn't because of a desire to disarm the Alanciari alone. Millions of Kashiri under arms were too much a temptation to an ambitious Sith. The job ahead was immense. 
He knew who he needed, someone whom he had quickly come to respect and admire, in a way he'd valued no one back home. He found her at Val Hall. The cleanup crew was still setting the place back to its proper functioning, but Quora was outside the courtyard wall where she'd left the Muntok team. She looked up from feeding them. It's getting crowded in there, she said. It'll get more crowded still. And busy. You saw your sentry, friend. Briefly. She set down the feed bucket. Looks like he'll be busy, too. He'll have a place of honor in our society, as our first visitor from Valencia. Adele looked at the alabaster tower, rising above the courtyard wall. Jogan won't be trusted blindly, as was Adari Val. In a sense, you might say we took him in. Trade for her. Quora didn't respond. She fastened a saddlebag to one of the Muntoks and detached him from the cart. Adele stepped toward her. You could join him, of course. Or do something else. Grand Lord Hiltz is impressed by the false tradition in the people here. Self-taught and all. He's always wanted to bring Kashiri into the tribe proper. With titles just like ours. He reached for her hand and looked intently at her. A number of roads are open to you, Cora. No, she said, smiling weakly and pulling her hand back. Only one. At the end of a time that had been filled with difficult, almost impossible decisions, the final decision had been the easiest. Watching the sun set as her Muntok loped into the city, Cora understood now why she traveled to Point Defiance that autumn evening. She'd become a boat on the canal of her career, yoked to a single direction. However far she advanced, knowing exactly what the rest of her life was going to look like had drained her. Others in the military state had lived with the same problem for years. But since the arrival of the Sith, the society seemed enlivened. Mysterious new prospects had opened up for all. Among them, only Quora still felt she knew what the future would look like. She alone had seen the Sith as they really were. Not like Jogan. Her correspondent at the end of the line was now the center of the world. He'd said they would talk soon, but he had never contacted her, and she had never made any attempt to find him. He was busy now, the one-time professional hermit, visiting one city in Alancier after another in the Good Omen to repeat the story of his adventure. It had already been dramatized, with the help of actors and songwriters imported from Keshta, into something that would replace the play of Adari Val. Adari had only been found on a rock. He had lived on one, before seeing the truth. Jogan Halder was the real rock of Kesh. He had never been a true sentry, she realized. Jogan aspired to a calling that hadn't flourished in Alancier since Adari Val's arrival. Now it would again. The hoary patriotic plays trotted out every observance day would be replaced with new productions, for every day. There would be storytellers again, and sculptors, and costumers, and actors. Everything put aside during the long emergency was returning now, with startling speed. Encouraged and abetted by the Sith, whoever quietly cultivated the notion that the last two thousand years in Alancier had been lost to a sort of collective madness. It was a notion that her friends, neighbors, and colleagues were readily accepting. Quora feared that, in the end, only she would remember Adari fondly. The signs of Sith evil had been visibly present in the actions of Bentadu, but the forces under Varner Hiltz had been on their best behavior since their arrival. The unification was now well underway. The plot to take in Jogan and the people of Alancier had been diabolical but subtle, and difficult to convince anyone of. Quora had tried more than once, quietly speaking to others she knew in authority. But all she got in return was the skepticism that should have been directed at the Sith, even from those whose judgment she'd previously trusted. No one wanted to hear from another Adari. Finally, she'd given up. She'd taken one last warning from Adari, though, and perhaps it would be the last one anyone ever heeded from the disgraced Herald. Adari's memoirs had told of her hope that by staying close to Yaru Korsen, she might someday learn enough to free her people. She had partially succeeded in that, by teaching the people of Alancier what she knew. But Adari had confessed to her own personal failings, too. By walking with Corson, she'd become the savior for a time, 
honored far above the Kashiri who had tormented her in her earlier life. And she replaced a dull and loathsome husband with a companion who, while more menacing, had far more intelligence. Idelvre had offered Cora the same opportunity. There were so many tasks ahead, and Adele needed her. And the Lancier needed her, in some sense. She might make things better, might soften the transition, and might even be able to bring some of his people's medical knowledge to a Lancier. There was a lot to Adele. Wasn't it better to be companion to a Sith High Lord than a Kashiri folk hero? No. The dream woman Oriel had told her she couldn't run from the inevitable, and her people weren't going to. She would accept it, too. But that didn't mean she had to run toward it. Adari had answered that for her. Quora padded the book of memoirs, safe in the saddlebag after its rescue from the archives. Yes, some animals are better than others, but they're still animals. Stay with your own. She found Brew in the twilight outside their Arar home, polishing the fire globes he'd shaped. Looks like you had a busy vacation. Her husband said, switching the devices off. That's one way of putting it, she said, dismounting. How was work? Pretty good. The weathered Kashiri patted the glass orbs and smiled. He was in demand now, as all artisans were. The Sith were interested in the devices. Kids are glad to be home. They'll be thrilled to see you. I'll surprise them, she said, kneeling to tie up the beast. Rue ambled back up the steps into the house, whistling. Cora <whistles> looked at their home, and then up the street. She knew what the rest of her life would look like, and she knew what the rest of her children's lives would look like. She would stay here, to guide them through, and her citizens, so long as her office existed. There wasn't really more to do. She looked at the stars appearing in the sky. Under the Sith, they would get new names. She hoped that somewhere among them lived the true protectors, ready to save their people. But she was prepared to be wrong. To read more adventures of the Lost Tribe, look for the Fate of the Jedi novels, now available in hardcover and mass market paperback. And find new stories in Lost Tribe of the Sith comic books by John Jackson Miller, available from Dark Horse Comics.